ESPN 2's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Radio Shack. This holiday, don't get a gift. Get the right gift at Radio Shack. American Chemistry, essential to living. Learn more at AmericanChemistry.com. And Red Lobster. Don't miss Endless Shrimp going on now. Only at Red Lobster. Back in Louisville, the Cardinals taking on the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. And Louisville quarterback Brian Brom has gaudy stats, a perfect record at home, and an NFL arm. But Brian's song hasn't always been sweet music to the fans here in Louisville. With more on that story, here's Stacey Dale Schumann. Dave, for the hometown sophomore, the expectations are always soaring, and the criticism is always present. Nobody ever seems to be satisfied around here. Last year, Stephon LaFors was one of the best quarterbacks in the country, but everybody wanted the hometown guy, Brian Brock. Now, he is the main squeeze, but with two losses still, nobody seems to be satisfied. His coach told us yesterday, the city, the state, the community, even myself at times, just don't appreciate this guy as much as we should. But the best attribute of Brian Brock absolute supreme sense of maturity he stays even keel he stays grounded and that really helps him get through the pressure dave and we saw that last year guys in the miami game when brom had to come into the fourth quarter with lafour's hurt he drove them down the field they got a touchdown to go ahead the hurricanes eventually won that game but we saw the poise in the true freshman last year at the orange bowl well he's been in the national limelight for so long i think people think he's older than he is and he's, he's only a sophomore quarterback He's only had eight starts, but he was the USA Today Player of the Year. He was a freshman who played last year. And so people think he's, you know, a junior or senior. He's not. And this is a very complex offense for him to have to learn. And for only eight starts, he has a mastery of it already. This Louisville team puts up a lot of points. And when the Rutgers Scarlet Knights entered Papa John's Cardinal Stadium earlier, they perhaps incited the Cardinals by huddling up on the Louisville Cardinal in midfield. You see the reaction from the Cardinals, who two previous times when teams stopped on the Cardinal logo, lit them up. 59 against East Carolina and 70 against Cincinnati. Yeah, you, you don't stomp on the other team's logo unless you're going to bring it. Because <laughs> you certainly are going to incite them. Uh, they're already mad enough at you. Why help? Rutgers has won the toss and will receive Todd Flannery to kick off for Louisville. Wearing the all-black uniforms tonight. And we are underway from Papa John's Cardinal Stadium. Willie Foster, who has three career returns for touchdowns, is tripped up and stumbles down to the 25-yard line. Now, the quarterback situation for Rutgers is a little bit more dicey. Mike Teal is making his third start despite a right shoulder injury. He's replacing Ryan Hart, who's the all-time leading passer at Rutgers. Hart, not playing tonight, also injured and also ineffective. And that's another reason why Teal is in there. That injury is to his throwing shoulder. It's a cool, wet night tonight. That might be difficult for a sore right shoulder. Deal with eight interceptions on the year and two touchdowns. Redshirt freshman, one of the top high school players in New Jersey a couple of years ago. From the 24, team of the air. And has a man complete Sean Tucker with a catch. Made of about 13 and a first down. A lot of weapons for Rutgers on offense. Brian Leonard, probably the best fullback in the country. True Frosh running back Ray Rice, fourth in the Big East in rushing. Tight end Clark Harris, first team All-Big East a year ago. Moses and Tucker, the receivers. And Zuda, Sosa, Stapleton, Glass, and McDonald up front for Rutgers. Scarlet Knights have allowed 14 sacks all year. And they'll be going up against one of the best pass rushers in the country in Elvis Dumerville tonight for Louisville. Weiss from the 36. And the ball is out at the 41-yard line. And Rutgers retains possession. So the true freshman Rice fumbles his first carry tonight. But Rutgers is able to recover it. I thought I saw Nate Nurse, 73, sneak in there at the end and get his hands on the ball. You mentioned Doomerville leading the league in sacks. Number 58 right in the middle of your screen. They ran right at him that time. They're still fighting for the ball, even though the signal. And Louisville comes out of there with it. The signal, though, nope. will be Rutgers' ball. Yep, yep. 
Yeah, it's ugly at the bottom of a fumble pile. Yeah, I, I, that signal occurred early on when I think it was Nurse 73 who got his arms around the ball, and I think an official signaled right away Rutgers ball, and then you had the scrum at the bottom of the pile. Yeah, and Dumerville reached one of those long arms in there to strip the ball out. Now watch, there is a ball down there. No, it's, it's 79, not 73. So it's uh, McDonald. McDonald, yeah. Yeah, he got his hands on it. So a break for Rutgers. And they actually get a four-yard gain out of it. Second and six now. They go back to Rice, and he's able to get away from Brandon Johnson and get back to the line of scrimmage. No gain of a play. Well, we mentioned Dumerville leads the country in sacks and in forced fumbles. Stanley, Okoye, and Grimsey also up front for Louisville. Brandon Johnson, long, rangy linebacker, came up with the tackle on the previous play along with Nate Harris and Abe Brown. Two pretty good corners in council, and Bobby Buchanan, younger brother of former Cardinal Ray Buchanan, Russell and Sharp, are the safeties. Dumerville, sub six feet tall, 250 pounds, but a great get off. That's why he's got 20 sacks, four shy of the NCAA record. Teal on third down. And perhaps the injured shoulder affected the throw there because Tucker was wide open in that pass way off target. Uh, it looked like he didn't get his feet underneath him trying to step up. You know, we talked to Greg Schiano before the game, and he said that he felt really comfortable with Teal. He said despite the bad shoulder, he had a good week of practice and felt like he was a, in good enough health to start this ball game. Radigan will punt it away to Montrell Jones. Backing up. Kid as he receives it at the 14-yard line. Glenn Lee levels Jones immediately. 45-yard punt, no return. And here is true sophomore quarterback Brian Braun, number two in the country in completion percentage and pass efficiency. Plus, he's 4-0 at home, 10 TDs, one pick on the year. Not many guys say no to Tennessee and Notre Dame to stay home and play football, particularly choosing Louisville over those powers. Best high school quarterback in the country two years ago. Both of his older brothers are coaches here. As Braun is spun down for a sack back at the nine, Ryan Neal. So Rutgers gets a sack on the first play from scrimmage defensively. And there's an injured Louisville player on the field. Let's get to the lineup first. Colby Smith starting for Michael Bush. Only his second career start. Barnage at tight end. Tinch, Douglas, and Jones, the wide receiving core. Pretty good offensive line for Louisville. Lefew and Spitz, seniors. Wood, Quarterman, and Darvo. And Darvo is the injured Louisville player. Senior right tackle from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Well, he's going to get it rolled up on. Look at number 74 right there. Yeah, and the sack rolls right into the back of his leg. That's why you've got to keep your feet moving. He thought he had a good solid block and didn't dawn on him that people might come in and, and fall into the back of his legs. Well, that ball should have been out of there. Brown held on to that ball a long time. Great coverage by Rutgers, and that's what caused the sack there. And Neal was the man that rolled up on Darvo. Neal with his eighth sack of the season. And this is not good for Louisville because the, Louisville leads the Big East in sacks with 34. But Rutgers is second with 33. And with their starting tackle out now, Darvo, now they've got a backup in. Now George Bussey, redshirt freshman from Louisville, will come into the game. These are two of the top teams in the country, not just in the Big East in terms of sacks. Nice matchup of guys who can get to the quarterback off the edge when you talk about Doomerville and Ryan Neal. He also comes off the edge a lot. They go empty here on second and 14. Quick drop for Braun. 
and again he sat. This time by Val Barnaby from the other side of the line of scrimmage. Now he had a tight end next to him, but Val Barnaby will go inside instead of out where the tight end was. And so that left Bussey with no help at all. Yeah, three-step drop, zone coverage. He was supposed to get rid of the ball quickly, but both his reads were covered immediately. Greg Schiano screwing up what they're trying to do there by coming up with guys right in the face of the receivers. Brom had nowhere to go with the ball. So two plays for Louisville, two sacks. Third down and 19 back at the Louisville 5. And they're just going to run it and try to give them some punting room. And Smith takes it out to the 10. They still be kicking it out of their own end zone. Devron Thompson on the stop for Rutgers. Out of the start for Rutgers defensively with back-to-back -back sacks against the guy who rarely takes sacks in Brian Brown. And those were coverage sacks. They, they were really dictated by the kind of coverage that took away the quick pass. Flannery on to boot it away. He just does get rid of it. And the fair catch call by Foster at the 45-yard line. So excellent field position for Rutgers and quarterback Mike Teal. When we come back to Louisville, no score early first. Well, Elvis Dumerville might lead the country in sacks for Louisville, but Rutgers with two sacks on the first two plays of the game. And they get good field position after the punt out of the Louisville end zone. Starting the drive at the 46 of Louisville. Play fake for Teal. Has a ton of time. And delivers complete inside the 35 to Sean Tucker. Already has two catches tonight. This is what they like about Teal. He's got a rifle arm and he can complete passes to tightly covered receivers on intermediate range routes. Now this is tightly covered at the end, but the ball gets in where it needs to be. Two catches for Tucker, two first downs. First down of the 34. Here's Rice. Able to get through the first line of defense down to the 29 for about five. Doomerville not only leads the nation in sacks, but leads his team in tackles. And Doomerville made the stop there on Rice, but after a five-yard pickup. You know what we haven't seen out of Rutgers yet is Leonard. Hey, Leonard's the big guy who really runs with a lot of authority, and he can catch the ball out of the backfield. They haven't gotten him involved in the ball game yet. Interesting, though, they send the 195-pound Rice, the little guy, right up the middle. Leonard is alone in the backfield here in second and five. Here's Leonard with his first touch, and he, we see the patented hurdle on his first touch of the game. <laughs> he leaps over John Russell. How many times have we seen Leonard do that in his career? <laughs> Ask yourself what you think if you're Russell and you come up to tackle this big guy, and the big guy jumps over you. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's not like Russell was down at ankle level. He's at thigh level. Look how high he gets in the air. Look how high Russell is. Pretty impressive. And the ball now at the 15. Rice back of the game. He gets it. And Rice down to the 10-yard line. Spilled by Malik Jackson. But another five yards on first down. You know what's good about this play calling, succeeding at the run, is that Elvis Dumerville can't sack the quarterback. And the more they can succeed at this, the more they force Dumerville to play the run, and that will slow him down on the pass rush. Dumerville did not have a sack last week against Pittsburgh until the final play of the game. And at that point, the game was well in hand. Pittsburgh did a pretty good job against him, but couldn't stop anybody else. Teal to the air. Pressure breaking, and Teal gets away from Dumerville. Stacked up at the 10. Johnson on the stop. Dumerville had a shot at Teal, and Teal did well to get back to the line of scrimmage. It'll be third down. Okay, Dave, but I, I got to take another look at Leonard. I mean, that was incredible. Let's go back here. This is two plays ago. This is a big guy who's going to make this move. We're talking about 235 pounds. Look at that. 235-pound leaper. 
over Brandon Sharp, who's six feet tall, and he was standing up. I mean, he, you've got to have some flexibility and a lot of athletic ability to do that. Here's third down and four. Flag down. Teal had a man tucker, but the pass off target. Again, a penalty flag on the play. Full start on the offense. Five yard penalty remains third down. So a dead ball foul as we bring Stacy in, who has more on Mr. Leonard. Yeah, guys, Brian can jump and leap, and all, but he's tough. This is a tough kid. His mom, guys, was a farmer. She grew up working on a farm. That's where he gets most of his toughness. He told me she got up and milked the cows every morning, milked the cows when she got home from school. His dad was a long-term serviceman in the Navy, and his brother, of course, played football also at Rutgers, Dave. And they both drank all the milk. Now, Brian got hit in the head with a golf club accidentally by his brother when they were playing one day. Brian was seven years old, and his reaction to it was laughter. Third down and nine. Teal looking for Leonard, who almost came up with a terrific catch. Incomplete, and the field goal unit will come on for Rutgers. Well, let's take a look at Teal. He looks healthy enough on this one. Bad shoulder and all. He puts his ball almost perfectly on the money. Leonard has to lay out for it. That arm looks okay. It does look okay. He's throwing it accurately. So Jeremy Ito, who's missed seven times this year, will try a 32-yard field goal. Trying to get something out of this drive, which started at the Louisville 46-yard line. And Rutgers strikes first with a 32-yard field goal. Ryan Leonard leaping over Brandon Sharp, getting his team in position for three. ESPN2's College Football Primetime is presented by the Nikon D50 Digital SLR. Incredible pictures made incredibly easy. And in part by Kia Motors. Kia, the power to surprise. Home of the Louisville Slugger, and also home of uh, Muhammad Ali. Brian Leonard, how about the athleticism that he showed on the previous drive for Rutgers, hurtling Brandon Sharp to get his team in position for a field goal. Rutgers defense getting it done, sacking Brian Brom twice already tonight. He'd been sacked only 10 times all year coming into this game. Ortiz to boot it away. Jones and Spencer back for Louisville. Cardinals have won 10 straight at home, going back to Bobby Petrino's first year in 2003. Spencer had trouble with it, now scoops. And has room to the outside. Inside the 40. Finally dropped inside the 30-yard line. Sometimes the bobble can work in your favor because it throws off the coverage lanes for the de defense. And that's what happened here. You see them get too far inside, and then a simple change of direction creates the opportunity to get outside. Spencer takes advantage of that and gets it down the field. And after that terrible start for Louisville being sacked, two of the first three plays, what a big play to put momentum back on their side. 61-yard kick return. Louisville scored a touchdown on a special teams blunder on the opening kickoff against Pittsburgh last week. Here's Colby Smith replacing the injured Michael Bush. And not much there in the cutback. Well, we talked about Rutgers acumen in terms of getting to the quarterback. Barnaby and Neal already with sacks tonight. Meekins and Reedus are the defensive tackles. The linebacking core led by Devron Thompson. Chenry Lewis, Quintero Frierson. Courtney Green is the leading tackler, second in the Big East. Geralt, Barnes, and Roberson make up the Rutgers secondary. Here's Brom. Has it complete at the 20-yard line. Caught by Joshua Tinch, the leading receiver in the Big East. Now 45 catches on the year. 
Strong completion by Brom. Didn't have that on the last drive. Last drive, struggled. He gets sacked on what should have been a quick release and then sacked again. Another quick release. Coverage was just great outside. Didn't get the ball out. Now, we've seen him show poise when he's not under pressure because he hasn't been under pressure this year from the pass rush. Now we'll see how he is under pressure. Third down and one. This is a situation where normally they'd run Michael Bush at 6'3", 250 pounds, but he's hurt. They have to go to the lighter, Colby Smith, but he does get the first down. Bumped out of play at the 17 by Frierson. That's an area normally, though, that it's Michael Bush all the way, and he often gets touchdowns. He leads the nation in scoring. Well, it's not just his short yardage that you miss Michael Bush in. You, you miss him everywhere. And he's, a, he's an every-down player. You can throw the ball to him. There you see him right there in the hooded sweatshirt. You know, big guy, good speed. He can catch it. He can pound you. He brings a physical nature to the offense. He didn't even miss a game in high school. Barnage is right open inside the 10. Cut down at the three-yard line by Corey Barnes. And another thing that not having Bush matters in is when they get down to this part of the field at 250 pounds they count on him to punch holes in the defense deep in the red zone to score touchdowns they've got 30 rushing touchdowns this year and bush has 20 of them to lead the country you saw that shot of shiano calling the defense he's one of just a few head coaches who double his defensive coordinators on first down and goal smith Gets bent over at the two-yard line and then somehow squirted through a tackle to the one. Colby Smith had a career-high 15 carries last week against Pittsburgh when Bush had to leave the game because of that sprained right foot. You think they could use that guy right now on the one-yard line? 250 pounds? Smith weighs 215 pounds. Oh, he tries to dive and he gets hammered at the goal line and did not get in. Devron Thompson just laid him out at the point of attack. Thompson came in underneath his face mask, hit him right in the throat, and caused him to bend his upper back back. Take a look at his upper back bend. Whoa, right there. Wow, was that a collision. Again, Smith weighs 215, Thompson 220. Bush weighs 30 more pounds than Thompson. He might go right through him if he's in the I game. guarantee you that doesn't happen if Bush is carrying the ball. Brom on the quarterback sneak on third down and goal. Got it. Touchdown, Louisville. Good surge by the offensive line, and Brom just ducks its head right in behind his guard and center to get into the end zone. So both teams cash in on possession started in plus territory. Rutgers are three, Louisville six, and then Carmody tacks on the extra point. So the Louisville native, Brian Brom, with his first rushing touchdown of the season, and Louisville leads 424 to go in the first. So Brian Brom of his fourth rushing touchdown of the season, and Louisville leads Rutgers 7-3, 4.24 to play in the first. Well, they didn't need Michael Bush on that drive. <laughs> Brom's not exactly small. He's about 2.30. Of course, uh, the kickoff return of 61 yards by Spencer set up the one-yard touchdown run for Brom. Foster and Underwood, who actually played some quarterback in a couple of games earlier this season, and option situations back to receive Flannery's kick. It's Foster. Tracked down at a 10-yard line. Terrific special teams play. Terrence Butler tripping up Foster at the 10-yard line. We've seen some terrific plays at the point of attack so far in this game. It's all about what you do when you get there, and Leonard brought something for the Louisville defense. And Devron Thompson bends Colby Smith in half. And what did we say? If you're going to dance, 
on somebody's logo, you better bring it at the point of attack when the game starts. And there's Greg Schiano running over somebody at pregame, setting the tempo. He can run you over. He's a pretty big dude. He's got a thick neck for a coach. He's won as many Big East games this year as he had in his previous four seasons combined. Got a start at his own 10, and there was some movement on the Rutgers offensive line. Tight end Clark Harris appeared to have moved. Prior to snap, false start on the offense. Number 77, five-yard penalty, remains first down. Pedro Sosa also moved, and that's the man that got tapped. You think this Rutgers team doesn't have Shiano's personality, a little toughness. They come out, they dance on the logo. Leonard jumps over a guy. You get a big hit on the goal line, and Shiano runs over somebody. That's toughness. Leonard on first down and 15 gets around Duberville and pushed out of play. Into about four or five on that play, sharp on the tackle. Saturday night, ESPN has the latest edition of the SEC's oldest rivalry, Auburn and Georgia. Saturday, 7.45 Eastern, college football primetime presented by Polaroid. It's also available in high definition on ESPN HD. Call your cable operator or satellite provider today. Who will win that game? Our first Friday night final, Auburn, Georgia. Huge game of the SEC. You know, Auburn usually wins when that ball game is in Athens. Nine out of the last ten, I think they've won. DJ Shockley is back after missing that loss to Florida. Rice on the carry. And the little back somehow fits through a small seam and gets up to the 18. Got eight on the play. Well, DJ Shockley, quarterback for Georgia, coming back from his knee injury. And I'll tell you this, if I'm Auburn, I don't do anything to help him. Don't help him up off the ground when he goes down because it hurts an injury, especially in the knee, when you have to get up off the ground. And so Shockley's going to play, but don't help him out. I like Auburn because of Kenny Irons. I, I think he's just been outstanding at running back lately. He's been carrying that team 600-yard games rushing in the last seven games. Boy, if Auburn wins that game, could set up a game with Bama next week for the SEC West title. A Georgia win and a Florida loss, and Georgia clinches the SEC East. Great attempt by Tucker to come up with the catch laying out. Council had pretty good coverage, too. But Teal could not complete the pass on third and two. And so Rutgers goes three and out. We'll punt it away. Joe Radigan to punt for the 50th time this year. Right around his three-yard line. And Haskins and Jones, two players back for Louisville to return the punt. Radigan's long this year, 56 yards. And this is a short line drive, and Jones just gets hammered, and he didn't get a chance to catch it, so a flag comes in. Marcus Daniels hit him right as the ball got there. You have to give the return man an opportunity to catch the football. Well, it, it looked, looked like Daniels, Daniels got him in the head. It looked like Daniels was blocked into him. Well, that doesn't matter, but it looked it looks like he got him in the head. Yeah, he, he got him in the head with the forearm. Yeah, the forearm shiver. And yeah, if you... If you push somebody into the kicker, you, the, it's the defender that still has the responsibility to not hit the kicker. But down there, I think the officials are talking about whether or not they think it was enough of a push to call it not a foul. They used to have the old halo rule. That was gone a couple of years ago. But you still have to allow the return man the opportunity to catch the ball. Kick catch interference on Rutgers is being wiped off. Number nine, legal block in the back of Louisville. 10-yard penalty from the end of the kick, first down. So apparently okay. the officials felt that he had enough time to catch the ball. Well, no, they, got, they got the block in the back. They're calling that a block in the back, which is overriding, interfering with the return. Okay, so Louisville, it was Bobby Buchanan. They said it was on number nine, but they meant 34 in black. Yeah, it's just a block in the back. And the, I thought they were upset about the hit to the head because they're always trying to protect guys from hits like that, but it was the block in the back that they got. Yeah, if, 
if a blocker pushes a guy into his own returner, it's not a foul. If he pushes him into his own kicker, it is a foul. They protect the kickers more than they do the returners. So Louisville will start at the 33-yard line on this drop. Brom has a rushing touchdown. The only TD in the game so far. Play fake. Brom looking deep. And Tim's trying to get free, and what a throw. Tim comes up with a play. Corey Barnes had decent coverage, but Brom put it on the number. But Louisville felt that they could beat the corners. Watch this ball. Watch how it drops in there perfectly to Tinch. Perfect location. But the reason it's perfect is that it allows Tinch to adjust to the sideline at the last minute. That's the only way he got separation on Barnes. From 69% completion rate on the year. That was a 36-yard completion. Here's Jerudia. Little flanker screen down to the 29. Brom has not had an incompletion yet in this game. Four out of four. And we mentioned earlier that he has two brothers on the staff here. Jeff, former Louisville and NFL quarterback, is the quarterback's coach. Brian's older brother, Greg, is the director of football operations here. Brian's dad, Oscar, also played quarterback in Louisville. George Stripling is coming to the game, the running back for Louisville here in the second and eight. And Stripling gets the carry up the left side. Down to the 26, Jacoby on the tackle. Well, Brom is the probably the most overcoached quarterback in the country. Now, we thought maybe it was Jordan Palmer, but this guy has his dad who helps coach him. You know, the head football coach, Bobby Petrino. Petrino's brother, the offensive coordinator. And then he's got his brother, Greg, you mentioned, who's a wide receiver here. And his brother, Jeff, who's the quarterback's coach. And, you know, Dad, I mean, you got five guys telling you how to play quarterback who all think they know it pretty well. Yeah, Brown told us yesterday he just chooses which information to tune out and tune in. Brown here on third down, throws his first incompletion, trying to hit Montreal Jones. Ryan Neal on the pressure, and there's a friendly flag down the play. Let's not forget, too, guys, since Brown is from Louisville, but he also has his high school coach and all his buddies that he played with in high school. And he's under a serious microscope here in Louisville. Parents on the defense, number 55. The ball be placed at the spot in infraction. Automatic. First down. But I also think that Braum gets so much attention, so much coaching, that it can be overwhelming. I mean, he didn't look comfortable to us yesterday talking about it. I mean, you know, he related the story about how after every ball game, he has dinner with his brothers and his dad, and they critique every play of the game every play put yourself in his position last year he's got his brothers already in the staff he's the hot shot quarterback out of high school and now he's going in and getting playing time in big games in place of a very good player Stephon LaFord as uh, that rushing play gets only a couple of yards Colby Smith taking it out and Westerman getting tackled at the 16 yard line I mean, when you have a film session coming up on Sunday or Monday and you get one before that with your brothers and your dad. I mean, you're probably just relieved if you just don't get walloped. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, how much joy do you find when you have that going on? Well, I think I think he's had to learn a balance there. There's his father, Oscar. And of course, he says he's the best of all the Brown quarterbacks. But no matter how good Brian ends up being, probably won't be the best quarterback ever to play here. Johnny Unitas, former Louisville Cardinal. Here, second and seven. And going up to get it is Tinge inside the 10. Another completion for Brian Braun. And the Big East leading receiver, Joshua Tinch, with another catch. Did you see him go down and help Tinch up? He went down and said, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. What he didn't mean to do was put the ball up that high over the middle, because that's how you get receivers hurt. Yeah, he got a face mask right in the back, just below where the shoulder pads come down in his back, and that's why right now he's stiff. Now you oftentimes get barbecued ribs when you throw them up there. Tasty. First down and goal at the five. Brown had a rushing touchdown the last time the Cardinals were done. Colby Smith gets it this time, and he is in! Touchdown, Louisville!
Well, no Michael Bush, and they still score twice inside the five on running plays against Rutgers. Well, Smith is not a pounder, but he's a slasher with great speed. He finds the hole, the seam right there, and bursts right through it. Runs through the arm tackles. And gets a great block from tight end Giacomini. Extra point is good. Rutgers got the first points of the game. Louisville has scored the last two times it has had the football. Number 89, Breno Giacomini. Take a look at the seal he gets. The fullback kicks out, and then that seal allows him to turn it up towards the goal line. Louisville is now tied with USC for the second most rushing touchdowns of the country this season. As the Cardinals have got it going after poor pass protection in the first four plays of the game, and also pretty good coverage downfield by the Rutgers second there. Yeah, 14 points without Michael Bush in the ball game. And they're a team that likes to pound it. As much as you see Louisville throw the ball, they really do that to set up being physical and running the football. But not having Michael Bush in the game means that in the fourth quarter, Rutgers defense won't be as exhausted as they would be. To drag this guy down for three quarters will exhaust any defense. They go back to last year, they had three pretty big backs. Actually, Bush was not the biggest back they had. That was Eric Shelton. Shelton yeah. They had some power backs a year ago when they went 11 and 1. Two backs that were drafted. Shelton and Lionel Gates was drafted as well by Buffalo in the seventh round. They had you know, three really quality backs. They've got six guys drafted, seven that are in the National Football League right now from last year's senior class. Taekwon Underwood of the goal line. And Underwood makes a man miss at the 25. Another at the 30. And up to the 36-yard line. And late flags fly in. The tension started pregame when Rutgers was dancing on the Cardinal in midfield. Dead ball. Personal foul. Old Rutgers, number 12. 15-yard penalty from the end of the kick. First down. That's Anthony Cowley. Back up tight end. We mentioned before the game, Rutgers huddling up and jumping up and down on a Cardinal at midfield. Yeah, that, that's a good way to rile them up. All you have to do is sneak in quietly and don't do anything and try and get it done. Look at the phalanx of officials between the two teams to make sure that Louisville doesn't go over there. That's like 85 Terrell Owens's. You remember when he jumped up and down on the Dallas Cowboys star? The last two times visiting schools did that here at Louisville, the Cardinals racked up 70 points and 59 points respectively. They got 14 already here in this game. And a broken play and Teal goes down at the 17-yard line. We're in Louisville, Kentucky where the Cardinals have won 10 straight home games. Louisville's lost twice. In fact, the only Ranked team without a winning record in conference. Both teams are bowl eligible, but nothing is guaranteed. Especially for a Rutgers school that's only been to one bowl in its history. It became bowl eligible two weeks ago, lost last week, and trails after one quarter tonight against the potent Louisville offense. 14-3 Cardinals after one. Louisville already with 14 points, and the Cardinals think they can get more. Stacy has that story. Dave, this Cardinal offense thinks they're invincible right now. After the first touchdown, fullback Dariontae Taylor looked at his teammates, gathered them up, said that Rutgers defense, they're weak. We can take it at them, push them in the chest every single time. And bear this in mind, Dave, 
They're outscoring their opponents 125 to 44 in the second quarter. Rutgers better gear up. Well, Rutgers does gear up on offense as Clark Harris, first team All Big East tight end a year ago, makes the catch. A reception now in 28 straight for Harris, who's turned himself into a big time NFL prospect. Well, Rutgers defense had better not let Louisville's offense get on a roll and feel invincible. They better disrupt them because when they get on a roll, there's, they're like nobody in the country except USC. Did you see Petrino on the sideline there? Not happy with his defense. Well, they gave up 45 points earlier this year to South Florida. Granted, Louisville turned it over a lot in that game. Rice out to the 46-yard line, four yards of the play. A Moldy Okoye, an 18-year-old junior, comes up with a tackle. What, what an interesting story. Man, there's a guy who started playing college football at 16. 16 years old. He's been, this is his third year. He's 18 now. And when he graduates, he'll, he'll be 19 years old. How about that? He's a junior in college, and only now can he even vote. Yeah, but he could play in the NFL. <laughs> Guys, he tested into the ninth grade at age 12. From Nigeria, grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. Teal looking to set up the screen to Leonard. The leading pass receiver for Rutgers is very close to the first down. Brandon Johnson on the tackle. Going to be a yard shy. Third down and one coming up. Three, you know, we're talking about Christian, not Christian Okoye, who's not related to Amobi. And Stacy, you know a little bit more about him than I think we do up here. Well, you know, Rod, uh, I spoke with Okoye, and he told me that his mom in Nigeria was a school principal. And when he was a baby, she couldn't find anybody to take care of him, so she took him to school with her every single day. And he said, being immersed in school my entire life, it's really made me the advanced student of biology that I am today. And he wants to be a doctor when he graduates. Rutgers 0 for 3. A third down in the game and movement by both Johnson and Sosa. The tight end and left tackle. Part of snap. Ball start. On the offense. Number 77. Five yard penalty. Remains. Third down. That's the second false start by Sosa. I think he's thinking about number 58 on the other side. I think I would. I mean, Doomerville has an ability to get off the ball it's very quickly. He's so quick, he can make you jump. Doesn't have a sack, but doesn't have to, to alter an opponent's offense. Teal with time, but short of the marker. Rod Council with a big hit. And Rutgers is going to have to punt the football on fourth down. Well, you're right about Elvis Dumerville, Rod, getting off the ball quickly. That's his trademark. He gets off the ball with the snap. And by doing that, he breaks down the offensive lineman's footwork because he's across the line of scrimmage so quickly. Chris Baker had the catch, but four yards shy of the first down marker, Joe Radigan comes on to boot it away. And we're going to have a fake. Either that or we're going to try to draw Louisville offside. Play clock is at zero, so that's exactly what they were trying to do. Delay of game going to be called on Rutgers. Yeah, the defense wasn't fooled at all because all that motion, that abrupt movement, doesn't look like any offensive football play ever. No offensive play looks that abrupt. It was clearly an attempt to draw them off sides. It was a fourth and four, so had Louisville jumped, it would have given Rutgers a first down. That's why they did that. But five yards could be big for Bobby Petrino's offense. They don't want to give him any better field position than they need. Jones and Hoskins back. Not a good kick by Radigan. Haskins gets away from one man. Fly down. And so is Haskins at the 28. But again, a penalty marker into the 20 yard line. William Gilkison on the tackle for Rutgers on special teams. Pick up the 
illegal block in the back on Louisville, number 13. Ten-yard penalty from the spot of the infraction. First down. That's safety, John Russell. Hey, Trevor, you were talking about Doomerville and how fast he gets off the ball. Well, we're going to track him all night and see how quickly he gets off the ball. Here's your look. What do you like here? As soon as that ball moves, he moves. However, he doesn't get an edge with Darnell Stapleton, Rutgers center, for a couple reasons. One is that Stapleton holds the ball very still. Another than Stapleton's wearing a glove. Now, so he can't see the blood go out of his knuckles when he squeezes the ball prior to the snap. You see 20 sacks, tackles for loss. That's because he gets into the backfield. He has a slightly less edge, though, because Stapleton is wearing that glove. Can he really see blood squeezing out of the knuckles you from over there? absolutely Not can. in that spot like that? You absolutely can. Louisville with a first down and 10 at its 11-yard line. Colby Smith, who had the touchdown, on the previous drive, is back in there, sets up a block, but the pass is nowhere near the receiver. Miscommunication between Jones and Brom of the play. Can you talk about Brom and the expectations people had for him? A lot of that comes from last season, what people expected, but they forgot about the fact that he's playing 70 snaps a game now. Last year, it was only 20 snaps a game. It's a big leap. That's his first incompletion of the game. 69% completion rate, good for second in the country. Second in pass efficiency behind the Heisman Trophy winner, Matt Leiner. And Brahm is a true sophomore. Big hole as the 20. And Smith tackled by Green at the 21 appears to have the first down. Well, the spot wasn't as generous as it originally appeared, so they're gonna measure here. So far, they do not miss the nation's leading scorer, Michael Bush. Oh, come on. They gotta miss him a little bit. 14-3, isn't well, it? Well, they've got the 14 points, but you know what they've done differently? They've thrown the ball a lot more. I mean, they've gotten away from being the kind of physical running team that they usually are. It is a first down. But that's an advantage you have when you're Louisville is that at all the skill positions, receiver, tight end, running back, you've got guys that can run, stretch the field, and catch the ball. So if you don't have your big power bludgeoning running back, Michael Bush, there are still a lot of options for the quarterback. That guy believes in a balanced offense, and Petrino's had it while he's been here at Louisville and certainly did it when he was at Auburn as an offensive coordinator. Petrino had success in the NFL, too, with the Jacksonville Jaguars under Tom Coughlin. Prior to his stint at Auburn, that was the offensive coordinator at Louisville back in the late 90s. Here Smith fumbles the ball, and it looks like Rutgers has it. The Knights do at the 25-yard line. Okay, I take that back about not missing Michael Bush. Well, you have to remember, you're asking backups to carry the load every down. There is a difference in being a spot player and being an every down player. And look how he's carrying the ball in his inside arm and out away from his body where it's exposed to the pursuit coming from the inside. Courtney Green forced the fumble. Quintero Frierson recovers and Rutgers for the second time tonight starts in Louisville territory, got three points the last time. When you come on the field for one or two plays, you can be conscientious and protect the ball. When you do it play after play, you tend to forget your fundamentals. Again, it's only the second career start for Colby Smith, who was a fullback last year, but starting because of a foot injury to Michael Bush, the nation's leading scorer. Ray Rice able to slip past Lamar Miles and pick up about two to the 22. This is an important moment for Rutgers offense. There's a penalty flag down on the play. Appeared to be a late penalty flag as well. Ball, personal foul on Rutgers number 27. 15-yard penalty, second down. That's on Ray Rice. Rutgers already with six penalties in the game. Well, I've got to wonder if this isn't just an extension of jumping up and down on the logo. Coming out, trying to be more physical than they need to be. They need to play football. Louisville with a 10-game home winning streak, ranked 23rd in the country. The only ranked team not above 500 in league play. Both teams are bowl eligible. Rutgers, for the first time since 1992, only been to one bowl game. That was in 1978. They didn't even leave the state. That was in the Garden State Bowl. 
and that penalty, that's a selfish penalty. You're in the red zone. You're not thinking about your team. You want to say something or you want to get back at a guy who's mouthed off at you. That's being selfish and not thinking about your team. Seven penalties on Rutgers. And a second and 24. Doomerville coming, but Teal steps up. And then the pass is batted down. There was a collision in the secondary. Trez Moses, the intended receiver, he collided with Miles, but incidental contact. And it's incomplete. This is only a two-man pattern. There are going to be four guys around Moses, and he just runs into one of them. But that penalty, huge, Rod. This drive is important for Rutgers because Louisville had ripped off a couple of touchdowns, and all of a sudden Rutgers gets a break with that fumble. It's important for them to score here. Was, was, that, that, pass was that incident? I don't know if that was incident. <laughs> now, he has a right to his ground, though. Yeah, but it was the offensive guy who knocked him off the ball. Third and 24. And Teal's pass is caught but well short of the first down. Baker on the catch. Pushed out right around the 35-yard line. It'll be a very long field goal if they try to John Russell on the tackle. Well, Doomerville has not gotten to the quarterback yet. And you see here, they use two guys to slow him up a little bit. And then a third guy comes over to make sure he doesn't get back there. One, two, three. Now the natural comparison is to Dwight Freeney because of the height. What do you guys think when you look at that comparison? Uh, I, I think that's right. I, I think Freeney, though, is a, is a bigger man. And Doomerville's probably 235, 240. You know, he can put on some weight, but he's not the same size as, as uh, Dwight Freeney. Freeney's about 260. Jones signaling for the fair catch, has it to 10, so Radigan does his job, hitting Louisville back at the 10-yard line. Cardinals by 11. Just over nine minutes remaining in the second quarter here in Louisville. Welcome back to Louisville. Birthplace of Muhammad Ali, who Wednesday received a Medal of Freedom, the highest award given to a civilian. Received that along with 13 others, including... Jack Nicholas and Frank Robinson in the Muhammad Ali Center opening this month on the 21st. And right now it's a 11-point lead for Louisville, and the Cardinals taking over at the 10, stripling into the game after Colby Smith fumbled the last time he had it. Devron Thompson on the tackle about a yard downfield. And how about the Scarlet Knights unable to capitalize on that Smith fumble? Instead, they went backwards because of a foolish penalty by Ray Rice. Yeah, that, that personal foul took them out of field goal range, deprived them of an opportunity to get a touchdown, so they got nothing out of it. That's just that's just a stupid penalty. That's how South Florida beat Louisville by capitalizing, uh, capitalizing on those Cardinal turnovers. Brom pressured and sacked for the third time in the game. Devron Thompson with the sack his second of the year. And Trevor, when Brom got up, he looked frustrated like he wasn't getting what he wanted from his receivers. Yeah, that was another coverage check. You pointed that out earlier in the game, Rod. There's nobody to throw the ball to. Look how much time he has to throw. Set, throw. Throw, throw, nobody there. Plenty of time to get rid of the ball on time. But has to hold it. Again, Rutgers in the top five of the country in sacks already with three tonight. Here's a running play by Smith. It goes nowhere. Barnaby in the tackle. Quick three and out for the Cardinals. And they'll punt it away. Rutgers should again get good field position here. And Barnaby's hurt right now for the Knights. The leading sacker for Rutgers coming into this game is Val Barnaby holding his left wrist. Oh, Barnaby's been able to put pressure on Brom all night long. Very first series, he was in the backfield. And if he's unable to go, that's going to be a big loss for Rutgers. Well, that starting defensive line has a total of 22 sacks now in the season. 14-3 Louisville. ESPN2's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Verizon Wireless. Now you can watch ESPN Sports Clips on the go with VCAT from Verizon Wireless. 
It's broadband quality video right on your phone. Churchill Downs here in Louisville. And in the race in the Big East, both these teams, Rutgers and Louisville, probably battling for second place. West Virginia's undefeated. Rutgers and Louisville both bowl eligible, but the Cardinals are 500 in the league. Nobody thought that the Big East would be uh, with teams as the punt is blocked and it's going to be a safety. Block punt for a safety. Oh, Manny Collins blocked the punt. Greg Chiano's happy he's getting a deuce out of it, and Rutgers is going to get the ball. Oh, we've gotten good play out of Rutgers' defense, and by and large, they're special teams. Look at this, speed. They're back there in a hurry. Well, speed is one of the things that has got Rutgers to six wins so far. They've got a lot of players from Florida and some of the fastest guys out of New Jersey over the last couple of years. And Manny Collins wasn't sure if he was ever going to play football again. He was in a serious car accident last October, had bleeding in his brain, had to miss the rest of the 2004 season along with two of his teammates. But he's back this year, the junior out of Plainfield, New Jersey, gets his second block kick of the year and that perhaps changes momentum giving Rutgers two points amazing that he's confident to be on a punt block team you're talking about a guy that after that car accident spent four months doing nothing because he had headaches well he gets his whole body in there on this and note how he gets that body in front of the kicker he doesn't run right at him he goes in front to where the ball is going to be that's a big game because Rutgers is already bowl eligible, but the last time they were bowl eligible, 1992, they had seven wins and did not get invited to a bowl game. And they had a chance to get win number seven last week, but lost at home to South Florida. Yeah, and, and Trevor, what they do after they after they got that sixth win, they just went nuts. They got to learn how to handle success. They did. They went down to South Florida and, uh, and sort of melted down early in that game. Gave up two turnovers, returned for touchdowns to South Florida in the first quarter. And their sixth win was against Navy at home. That's a short kick to be taken by Moses at the 40-yard line. And Moses still going. Moses parting the Louisville defense and getting to the 47-yard line. Richard Raglan on the tackle. Well, Greg Schiano told us that it's very hard for teams to play well after you play a physical Navy team in Maryland, Stanford, and Rutgers all lost after beating Navy the previous week this season. Well, Navy does a lot of cut blocking, and Rod, you've played defense against teams like that. What's that like? Well, it is a pain. You spend all week in practice fending off guys who are cutting your legs out. You get beat up, bruised up, and then you go face a team like Navy at full speed, and you are a little beat up, and it takes you a few days to recover for that next week. And then you play against the South Florida team that has a lot of speed. It's an entirely different game. And South Florida beat them. Brian Leonard on the call. Down to the 44-yard line for about three yards. Chad Rimsey on the tackle. Well, we mentioned that West Virginia's in the driver's seat of the Big East at 5-0. Rutgers at 3-2. Louisville at 2-2. Two two. South Florida really controls its own destiny. Will play West Virginia the final game of the regular season in Tampa. But still a lot of work to do. South Florida plays Syracuse tomorrow. The Orange have yet to win a conference game this year. Greg Schiano's team has won three road games this year. First time that's happened in 17 years. And they also lost a road game in overtime this year to Illinois. Leonard trying to score through a hole, does to the 39, got five, and a key third down and short coming up. Preston Smith on the stop. Let's play what if for just a minute. What if South Florida wins the Big East? Well, they're going to a BCS Bowl. That's one thing for sure. Well, we're talking about a program that's not very old. It's not very old, but I think it'll be one of the dominant programs in this conference over the next several years. Down in Florida, they get the kids that don't have scholarships available for them at Florida, Florida State, or Miami, so they're very, very talented. And South Florida lost to Miami this year to Pitt, and only by 10 to Penn State. Third down and two for Rutgers. After the safety, trying to keep a drive alive, and Teal is hit. Pass incomplete. John Russell put pressure on Teal and broke up the play. Well, Mike Cassidy, the defensive coordinator, believes in pressure. He's not afraid to get his secondary involved in it. There you see a shot of Cassidy up there. And he'll bring them all from here. Finds the weakness. Manages to get his safety, Russell, free to put pressure on Teal. 
And that leaves everybody else in man coverage, and they've had struggles at corner. But Mike Cassidy said they'll live through the struggles at corner. They will not change their pressure philosophy. Rutgers 0 for 6 on third down. Instead of trying a fourth and two inside the 40, still early in the game, they elect to boot it away. Radigan kicked it inside the 10 last time, and he does it again. And then Jones gets planted and somehow hung onto the ball at the 9-yard line. John Beljour just popped him as soon as he caught the football. I'll tell you one thing, Rutgers may not be winning on the scoreboard, but they're more physical than Louisville's been tonight. Well, that's been a criticism all year of this Louisville football team. But the Cardinals do lead 14 to 5, 5.55 to go. In quarter number two, the offense for Louisville back on the field when we come back. Well, Rutgers is losing on the scoreboard, but winning the field position battle. This will be the fourth start for Louisville inside its own 15-yard line. This time they'll start at the eight, and that's the best way to derail a potent offense. Back them up. Rutgers has been able to sack Brom down in this territory tonight. Yeah, he's been sacked three times down here in the game. Colby Smith on the carry, getting to the outside. Flag down, and so is Smith at the 12-yard line. Jamal Westerman on the tackle. And that was thrown in the area of offensive holding. We've seen physicality at the point of attack by Rutgers in the game. All Rutgers on the goal line. On special teams. Then we see Brian Leonard with a little grace. Sleeping over a defender. In the two games that Louisville has lost, and Rutgers knows this, they got hit in the mouth. West Virginia beat Louisville. Steve Slayton had 188 yards rushing. South Florida only threw the ball 10 times. They pounded the ball. They out hit Louisville. And that's what Rutgers will need to duplicate to slow this offense down. So first down and 14 from the four yard line. I'm changing things up, learning the time of the play clock. And Brom to the air, throwing out of his end zone, throws a strike to Montrell Jones out to the 11, seven yards of the play. You can often tell how good teams are by their common opponent. Both these teams played West Virginia. Both of them lost. Rutgers by 13. Louisville by two. You see the offense. Rutgers didn't get much done. But a lot of turnovers by Rutgers. Louisville didn't have a lot of turnovers. That game was a triple overtime against West Virginia, but the rush defense by both teams against West Virginia, very poor. Brom to the air, and again throws a dart. Pass out to the 30-yard line, Harry Douglas, the fastest player on this Rutgers offense. Gets the Scarlet Knights a first down at a game of 19. Trevor, yesterday, Paul Petrino told us he felt confident that his receivers could beat the corners. And they do. This is man coverage all the way with a free safety deep behind to keep the big play from happening. And it was that one-on-one -on -one underneath that Brom beat. And Brom gets the ball off on time against man-to-man -man coverage. Helps make the play. Play fake. And that pass a little bit short of Douglas, incomplete. Well, you mentioned at the start of the broadcast that Brian Brown was recruited by everybody two years ago. Ended up staying home to play in Louisville. And then last year, split time, so to speak, with Stefan LaForce, even though LaForce was very successful, ended up getting drafted in the fourth round by the Carolina Panthers. Brom almost led Louisville to a victory in the fourth quarter at Miami. Now he's the starter, and he's had a great year. He's in the top two in completion percentage and pass efficiency, and has a five to one touchdown to interception ratio. But his team has also lost twice, and he's been criticized by the fans for that, as Smith takes it out to the 35. ESPN Game Plan features 15-plus college football games each week, so if you can't find a big game you want this Saturday, it's a great chance it's on ESPN Game Plan. USC and Cal, Kansas and Texas, and Miami Wake Forest. Cal, the last site where USC stumbled. Does it happen again? No. Third down and five, Brom out of the gun. They go five wide here. 
again completes to Jones. No, he couldn't hang on to it. Incomplete. So it's fourth down and five. Derek Roberson on the coverage. Yeah, you're talking about game plan and what's coming up tomorrow. One of the great things about game plan is that there's no excuse for any voter in any poll not to be able to watch top teams and make their own comparisons. You know, tomorrow you can watch USC and you can watch Texas side by side and figure out what you like. And if you miss them, you can watch them on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday because they're stored in the archive. So, in other words, you're saying Idaho should not get votes again. <laughs> they got five in the open, one in the opening poll. Foster going to let this one go. Louisville is around it and will down it inside the five. Pretty windy here in Louisville, and it's blowing the ball down to the one. you got to catch that ball. You have to catch that punt. You're at your 20-yard line. You have plenty of room to go back. You go catch it because of this. 64-yard punt. <laughs> the wind... Gets an assist of about six yards. And Rutgers has the start of the one. Interesting position here for a redshirt freshman quarterback, Mike Teal, who's only starting for the third time this season. Right now, you ask yourself, where's 58? Find 58. That would be Elvis Dumerville, the nation's leader in sacks. Who's been a little bit on the quiet side tonight. Leonard just muscles to the five. Nate Harris met him in the hole, and Leonard drove him to the five-yard line for a gain of four. Well, Cal is the site of the last USC loss, as we mentioned. The Trojans have won 31 straight since to the naked 32 straight as we hit our Friday night primer. Well, I think the only thing Cal has going for them is that this game is in Berkeley. It's going to be crazy there. But this is a young Cal team. I think SC handles their business pretty comfortably. Here's Leonard to the outside. Gets the first down. Out to the 14-yard line. I think they have such a huge advantage right now at quarterback USC does. Joe Ayuba, uh, the talented young kid, but can't hold up with Leonard. And do keep in mind that Matt Leonard only has one class this year. It's ballroom dancing. So while Joe Ayub is studying at UC Berkeley, his classes and his homework, Liner is in the complex watching film. Well, he's earned that right. He's won a Heisman, played for a few years, senior, took his classes. Leinert's numbers this year are actually better than they were last year, if you look at him. And won the Heisman Trophy. Leonard again. And this time they grab him and drop him at the 16. Doomerville on the tackle. Let's go to the studio, check in with Reese Davis, who's going to tell us what's coming up at the half. Reese? All right, Dave, Jim Don alongside. We'll take you to Tuscaloosa as they get set for an SEC Saturday, a trifecta of showdowns. We'll also talk about some guys, probably long shots in the Heisman race, and also look ahead to USC and Cal. And I'll break down all those three big SEC games for you. And you know, I'm also going to tell you at halftime why Jim Donnan has something in common with Mel Gibson. Don't you see the striking resemblance right there? <laughs> Almost as close as Trevor Maddox is to Tom Cruise. No, because Jim Donnan's a lethal weapon. Flag down, Teal kept his balance, got back up before the knee hit the turf, and it's an incomplete pass. If your knee goes down in college, it doesn't matter whether you're touched, the play is dead. But he was able to keep his knee from hitting the ground. But again, a penalty flag anyway. Florida staff. Ball start. On the offense. Number 81. Five-yard penalty. Remains second down. And now it's second and long. This is the time for Elvis Dumerville to feed. Keep your eyes on number 58. Second and long. Third and long. Are you guys seeing anything particular they're doing to him because he's not gotten to the backfield yet tonight? Well, yeah, we've seen it earlier. They, they bring two guys out. Sometimes they bring a third guy over. They chip him with the running back, but they'll use anything down here to keep Dumerville from creating a sack. And they've done a good job of mixing the run and running right at Dumerville, making him play the run. Right now, they're in passing situations. Deal with a straight drop, setting up the screen to Rice. And he 
cannot get away from a defender, Brandon Johnson, who had NFL scouts salivating earlier this year, has been a little bit of a disappointment in the latter stretches, showed why he had scouts salivating, making that play on the ground. Well, they've got two guys on Doomerville here, and then they throw the screen away from him. They were very much aware of where he was on that play. And we got a timeout on the field. So Doomerville doesn't have the sacks, but the rest of the Cardinals defenders do it pretty well, holding Rutgers to five points. We welcome you back to Louisville. Rutgers down eight. We've talked a lot about Elvis Doomerville. One of the reasons he's so successful is because he's got really long arms. Our producer, Kim Belton, who is a fantastic basketball player, is six, seven. Doomerville is six feet. They have the same wingspan virtually. Six, seven wingspan. He has to wear about a 40-inch sleeve length, guys. He's got long arms, and he knows how to use them, Dave. Yeah, Doomerville listed it six feet tall, but probably about 5'11". As Teal overthrows him, it's picked off by John Russell, and he has some blockers in front of him. Russell finally ripped down at the five-yard line by Rice. Ninth interception thrown by Teal this year in the first pick for Russell in 2005. Well, sometimes you're better off just throwing it away. Here's your safety. He's just going to hover back here. Your quarterback just lofts it up there, overthrowing his man. Keep your eye on the safety. He's just reading Teal, waiting, waiting, waiting. And there's the ball right to him. And pressure by guess who? Elvis Doomerville. He gets a great jump on the snap and then comes inside the double team. That's Samir McDonald. He's got help outside, but Doomerville comes inside. The pressure caused the pick. Closest he's been to the quarterback all night, and it forces a turnover. Colby Smith bouncing to the outside. Touchdown, Louisville! Great block on the edge, on the force, keeping him inside. And Smith gets right out to the corner. That's Kevin the last trying to get inside there was just blocked inside. And the whole edge opened up. Third rushing touchdown of the night for Louisville. Extra point is good. Colby Smith replacing the nation's leading scorer in Michael Bush. And Smith has 12 points. Two touchdowns set up by a 32-yard interception return by John Russell. Here's Doomerville's pressure. Look at the ball move, and he gets off the ball faster than the defensive tackle next to him. That allows him to break down the technique of the double team, and he gets inside for the pressure. A red shirt, fresh, red shirt freshman quarterback. Big mistake down there in the red zone. If you don't turn that ball over, you have a chance to go in at halftime down by nine points. Big swing. And Greg Schiano may have to make a decision at halftime. Ryan Hart, the all-time leading passer for Rutgers, not starting tonight in part because of ineffectiveness, but also because he has a right shoulder injury. Is he healthy enough to play? if Shiano wants to make a change. That's well, the question. Shiano told us before the ball game that he could use Hart if necessary, but he reiterated that he made the change because he felt that Teal was the guy that gave him the best chance to win. It wasn't an easy decision to move out a guy who's an all-time career passing leader, but he saw more upside with Teal. Going with a redshirt freshman instead of a senior, Underwood pitching it to Willie Foster. And Foster, pretty nifty moves. Off to the 30-yard line. Nice return. So Rutgers will have 41 seconds left. And all of its timeouts. 
Well, the place that Rutgers hasn't challenged yet is the corners. Keel knows that he's got mostly man coverage outside in Trez Moses, in Willie Foster, Sean Tucker. He's got very fast receivers, and he hasn't gone out there very much. Now would be the time to try those one-on-one -on -one corners. I, I don't think so. I think they're a little shell-shocked right now, and they want to get Teal in at halftime and settle him down. I wouldn't throw the ball out there after that pick. Total yards even, but the score isn't. Louisville by 16. And they run the ball with Leonard. Tackled at the 32 by Nate Harris. Yeah, you, you know, you've got a young quarterback. He just made a big mistake. You're 30 seconds away from halftime. Get to the locker room, get settled, and try to come out in the second half. I mean, Rutgers has out hit Louisville. They've been more physical, but they've made big mistakes in their own territory. 62 penalty yards for Rutgers. They recovered a fumble at the 35-yard line, but then they had a personal foul. Pushed them out of field goal range. And then the turnover inside their own 5-yard line leads to a Louisville touchdown. 21-5, Bobby Petrino's Louisville Cardinals leading at the half. To the studio we go. Reese, Mark, and Jim standing by. Fellas. All right, Dave, Mark's got the night off. We're getting them all rested up. Glad they're up. Getting big 73 ready for a full day on Saturday. Conditioning kicking in. Oh, he's uh, going to be ready tomorrow. And he's always ready, and you're ready here now. I look at the end of the first half, Jim. We were all prepared to say that Rutgers had held Louisville to its lowest first half point total at home this season. And Mike Teal just made an egregious error. Yeah, that's one thing that you can tell this redshirt freshman. Hey, you, you can't win the game at the end of the first half, but you can certainly lose it. You got the whole second half to play against these Louisville Cardinals. And you gave him a lot of momentum going into the half now, 21-5. to And welcome back to Louisville, the Howl at the Moon Saloon, which is hopping. A lot of uh, Cardinal football fans. Here tonight, better than 40,000. This uh, Louisville Cardinal team has won 10 straight at home, trying to make it 11 in a row, leading by 16 at halftime. But you look at the stats, and it might surprise you. I mean, Louisville's a team that averages 500 yards total offense. Guys had less than 130 in that first half, yet it's a 16-point lead. I tell you, the Rutgers defense has been impressive. They've done a great job out there, but a short field for Louisville resulted in a couple of scores, and there's your difference in the ballgame. There's a difference in addition. Rutgers offense just really hurt themselves with penalties. They moved the ball fairly well against Louisville, but then penalties forced them to move back and not be able to score. One of the criticisms of Louisville going uh, into this game was lack of physicality. Got beat by South Florida, and tonight beat up in a lot of ways by Rutgers, even though Louisville's winning. Yeah, if you didn't know the score, you'd watch this and you'd say, Rutgers is clearly outplaying Louisville. Big hits over and over, but the turnover, penalty, short field, a couple of easy scores for Louisville. But again, 128 yards total offense, 31 yards rushing. Louisville is playing tonight without leading rusher Michael Bush, who has a foot injury. Rutgers has sacked the quarterback three times, but 0 for 7 on third down. And eight penalties for 62 yards. A foolish personal foul penalty that pushed the Scarlet Knights out of field goal range after they recovered a Louisville fumble right around the 35-yard line. And part of the reason they're 0 for 7 on third down is that penalties force them from, say, third and four to third and nine. And that happened repeatedly. Two of the Louisville touchdown drives less than 30 yards. Montrell Jones and Sergio Spencer back to receive the kick from Michael Cortez. Jones waits for it and has it now at the 20-yard line. And will get stopped at the 22. Nice open field stop there by Clarence Pittman on the return. Tackle made by number two. Stacy Dale Schumann is going to tell us what the coach has said at halftime. Well, Rod Gilmore, Coach Ciano agrees with you. The defense has been really good for Rutgers, but offensively, obviously non-existent. He said we have to do a better job controlling ourselves. Two silly turnovers in terms of creating personal fouls. And on the other side with Petrino, he also likes his team's defense. He said, but keep an eye on us because we're going to look long in the second half. More offense he wants, guys. Yeah, again, 128-yard total offense, 21 points, but thanks to Rutgers' mistakes, they had great field position. Brown was looking deep, 
And he eludes his fourth second and gets a great block from Colby Smith. And then how about Brian Brown, not known for his athleticism, getting about 10 yards. Derek Roberson eventually on the tackle. You think he learned a little something watching Stefan LaFour's last year? He's not done this very often, but when he has, he's been successful. He's not a shake and bake guy, but he's got a little wiggle right there. Well, he's got a little self-preservation. He's not known for athleticism, but for goodness sake, he's now known for knowing how to not get hit. Gain of about nine yards and a half. And Colby Smith gets the first down, taking it out to the 34. Cornell Meekins on the tackle. Louisville comes into this game with a record of 6-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in the conference. Winners of 10 in a row here at home. Last loss in 2003 to Memphis. Rutgers has played very well on the road this year, winning three times. And has three road wins for the first time since 1988. Can they do it here in one of the toughest places to play in the country? They haven't had a lot of offense tonight. No Michael Bush. And as uh, Stacy pointed out, they'd like to get deep. But Rutgers has mixed up their coverages. Instead of giving man-to-man -man coverage a lot, they've played a soft zone a lot. Bobby Petrino not happy with uh, his quarterback, Brian Brom, for calling timeout. You know, we talked with Petrino this week, and he admitted to us that even he sometimes doesn't appreciate Brian Brom and what he's meant to this football team as a true sophomore. Look at the intensity there. I mean, this is his sophomore quarterback. He has high expectations for him. He's boring into him with whatever mistake happened out there. This is intensity from your head football coach. One of the five guys who coaches your young quarterback. And you can read his lips and what is your problem? We went over this. He missed a check. Well, we talked in the first half that Brian Brom might be the most overcoached quarterback in the country. Has two brothers on staff here. Jeff is the quarterback's coach. Brother Greg is the director of football ops. Both played at Louisville. Brian's dad, Oscar, was a quarterback at Louisville. And then he got Paul Petrino, the offensive coordinator, and his brother, Bobby, the head coach. I bet he listens to the head football coach, though. Doesn't have a choice. First down from the 34. And Brom drills as he gets rid of it and able to hit Tinch at the 40-yard line. Rovers in the tackle. Bobby Petrino has got it like this. He had the right play. And he took the pressure. And he's been under pressure all game long. In part because of what you said, Rod, that secondary for Rutgers has been leaving a few places to throw. He's looking downfield. He's trying to find a receiver. And he's like, hey, wait a minute. Somebody's supposed to run the right route. On the misdirection, stripling in the open field. Down inside the 45-yard line, we see some adjustments made offensively by Louisville at halftime. A couple of misdirection plays here on this drive. Well, what happens here, look at this side of the line. All the defense comes way upfield, and the handoff happens very, very late. They have not shown this play in the first half, and it took Rutgers by surprise. 17-yard pickup for George Stripling. Had 117 yards against Cincinnati earlier this year. Bush didn't need to play. At that stage of the game, because they were blowing out the Bearcats, Bush not playing tonight because of injury. Colby Smith, starting in place of him, has two touchdowns in the game. And Brom goes to his tight end. A penalty flag down as G. Camini gets stopped by Geralt at the 34-yard line. But again, a penalty marker into the play. Well, I like this by Brom. He looked all the way over to his right and then spun back around to find his tight end on the left side of the field. Block in the back on the offense. Number 86. Ten yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Replay. First down. So they're going to get Montreal Jones right here. And that's clearly a block in the back and a guy who is in a position to make the tackle. Guys, we were talking earlier about perhaps Brian Brown being the most overcoached player in college football. When you look at his numbers, 69% completion percentage, second in the country, second in the country in pass efficiency, 5-1 to one touchdown to interception ratio. How do you criticize him? He's been getting a lot of scrutiny, not only from the fans, but also uh, from some folks in the program. Here's Stripling breaking free again into the secondary. 
Bobby Petrino told us that both Colby Smith and Stripling have more speed than Michael Bush, and we've seen that in the second half so far. Well, they're taking advantage of the aggressive nature of the Rutgers defense and the speed running the cutbacks, Trevor, that you mentioned. And they, they do that by getting the ball deep to the running backs and allowing them the opportunity to cut behind those penetrating defensive linemen. Only Matt Leinert has a better pass efficiency number than Brian Brom. Brom had been number one for most of the year, and he's been very efficient in this game. Our first down, Brom to the air again. And again, he finds Tinch. Pretty simple. Brom makes it look easy anyway. Gain of about... 17 yards down to the 10. Uh, look who Brom is in between. You talk about Heisman Trophy candidates. Top players. Liner to the left, Young to the right. And the guy in the middle, probably the only reason he's not a Heisman Trophy candidate is that they've lost two games. But keep in mind that this is the first year that Brom has as a starter. He's only got eight starts before tonight. Brom has only had three incompletions all game. Play fake, and Brom has an open man, Colby Smith. Touchdown, Louisville. Smith's third of the night. Two rushing touchdowns, now a receiving touchdown for Colby Smith, and Brian Brom makes it look so easy. Well, this works because of the running attack, the success of the running game earlier in the drive. There is no linebacker anywhere near Colby Smith when he catches that ball because of the play-action fake. Extra point is good by Arthur Carmody. Well, we mentioned that Brahms' brothers both played at Louisville, and his dad also played at Louisville. When we come back, we'll hear from Brian's brothers about who the best quarterback is in the family. Brian Brom, four for four on the touchdown drive of 42 yards, hitting three different receivers. And you see his brother, quarterback coach Jeff Brom, giving him a little grief on the sideline. This is just a few plays after the head coach gave him grief, and they just scored a touchdown. Going back to what we said before, well, what do you have to do to please someone? I mean, you're up there in almost every category in the country. You've only thrown three interceptions all year. You're a true sophomore. You're completing 69% of your passes, but who is that good enough for? But that's what happens when you've got a coach and your brother, who's your position coach, first one speaking of Bobby Petrino, who know what your potential is. They know that as well as Brian Brown has been playing, he's even better than he's showing. And that's what they're trying to get out of him is that extra upside. That was a 78-yard drive for Louisville after it had only 128 yards the entire first half. We did see some plays we did not see in the first half. Here's Tyquan Underwood on the kick return. Ooh, gets belted at the 25 and a penalty marker in. Terrence Butler with a big hit, but again a flag down. You know, we're talking about Brom being overcoached. You have to remember, his brothers, both his brothers, were in high school when Brian was born. I mean, so he didn't really have brothers he grew up with. He had almost three dads. Holding on Rutgers during a return, number 46. Tenure apparently being forced from the end of the kick. First down. Well, Brian's brother, or Brian's dad, Oscar, is in the stands. Tonight, let's hear from his other two, quote, dads, Jeff and Greg, about who the best quarterback is in the family. You know, I must have lost the coin flip or something growing up because I didn't get to play quarterback, but uh, my dad thinks he's the best quarterback. And, of course, Jeff probably thinks he's the best quarterback. And, yes, I do. <laughs> um, uh, I would think Brian thinks that he's the best quarterback, too. But that's the big argument that we, uh, you know, everybody tries to plead their case. Greg played wide receiver at Louisville. Jeff played quarterback and played in the NFL for some time. And now their younger brother, Brian, is the starting quarterback here at Louisville. And one of the best QBs in the country is Brian Leonard, who takes a handoff and rushes to the 21 for about five yards. Well, Brian's going to be better than all of them. I, I don't have any doubt about that. You see, he, he gets coaching consistently from everybody, whether it's on the field or at dinner, and they've done that since he was young, and he's blossomed with There you see a shot of Greg. And I, I just think with his quick release, his arm, his footwork, he's going to be the best quarterback in that family. 
And whether it's next year or two years from now, might be the best quarterback in the NFL draft. As Teal's about to get sacked, and he somehow got rid of it right through the hands of Clark Harris, incomplete. Third down and five. And Doomerville put a little pressure on Teal. Talk about this guy being overcoached. We saw Bobby Petrino get in his face just a few minutes ago. Got to listen to the head coach, offensive coordinator, Paul Petrino. Saw him talk to him a little bit. His brother, Greg, upstairs. He's going to talk to him at dinner. And Jeff Brumman, quarterback's coach, he came over and talked to him. And when he gets home, his dad, Oscar, is going to have a few things to say about it. But you know what? That's okay because they know he can play and they know he can be better. Brian played at Trinity High School here in Louisville, so his head coach from Trinity also will be in the zoo on occasion. And again, good coverage downfield by Louisville in the sack by Chad Rimsey. We have not called Doomerville's name a ton tonight, but he certainly is having an impact. Well, there you see him, top of the screen, and when you require two guys and then a half guy to look your way, you are forcing single blocking somewhere else. And it was Brian Leonard, who was the guy on the double, who's one of their best receivers, who could not get out into the pattern quick enough to help because he had to block. Radigan standing at his goal on here in fourth and 11. Jones grabs it at the 39. Slips a tackle. Lowers the shoulder and shoved out at the 45-yard line. Doomerville's been a great story this year for Louisville. What's been the best story in college football this year? That is the focus of our Friday night debate when we return to Louisville. Back in Louisville, the Cardinals leading Rutgers 28-5. Even though Rutgers is losing, Greg Schiano and the Scarlet Knights, one of the best stories in college football this year, already bowl eligible. First time that's happened since 1992. They have only been to one bowl game, and that was back in 1978. The Garden State Bowl. Brian Brom has been a pretty good story this season for Louisville. True sophomore quarterback, even though this team has lost twice and right now is 500 in Big East play. Has 14 touchdown passes, 15 touchdown passes now with one tonight. Only three interceptions out of here. Going to the air again. And he still completes it despite getting hit and then the pass is dropped at the last second as Yerudi just got leveled in the back. Roberson just clobbered him. And Yerudia couldn't hang on to the ball. Well, he had to jump up in the air to make this catch. And again, that exposes his torso underneath the pad. Now, Brown gets hit as he throws. That makes the ball go high. But look at him jump up in the air, and that's why that hit hits him in a vulnerable spot on his back. Interesting, because it appeared that he caught the ball, made a football move, and then the ball came out. So it could have easily been ruled a fumble. And they run that little misdirection handoff again, and Stripling is down to the 48. Well, we've been mentioning over the last couple of minutes some of the best stories in college football this year, and that is our Friday night debate. Trevor and Rod, in your opinion, which is the best story in college football this year? Well, there are so many. It's hard to pick. I'd say on the field, a moment that I thought was outstanding was USC Notre Dame in the Bush push to win that ball game. And how can you not be impressed with Penn State and Joe Paul's return to prominence? But for me, the biggest story had to be Tulane and watching them get back on the field after Hurricane Katrina and just turn in such a performance trying to deal with everything they went through this season. Brown finds Tinch, breaks one tackle, and down to the 29-yard line. All right, Trevor? Well, Rod, you alluded to it. Uh, I would add Penn State in a little more detail to that. The last couple of years they've been down. People have been calling for Joe Paterno to retire, saying that he was past his prime, he could no longer coach, he was damaging his legacy, and all of a sudden, here they come with a good chance to win the Big Ten in the year after people were saying that he should retire and I think that is a, a terrific comeback and a great story all right guys first down at the 29 now of Rutgers and, and in the round 
Harry Douglas trying to get in the open field, and Rutgers is all out of it, all over it, rather, and uh, pick up about three on the play. Uh, you can go to ESPN.com, keyword Friday Night Debate, tell us what the best story of the college football season has been, and 38% of the 57,000-plus uh, that voted say Charlie Weiss and Notre Dame. 7% say that Rutgers Bowl eligibility is the best story in college football this year. And UCF, 6-3 and three after zero wins a year ago. Pretty good story as well. Yeah, I'm surprised there's no love for Joe Pa in that, uh, in that poll, but those are all outstanding stories. It's been a great season of college football. And we're not done yet. On second down, Colby Smith to the 20. Got about six. Going to be a half yard shy of a first down. Let's go to the mailbag, fellas, and see what the fans, the true experts, have to say about things. The Rutgers story is to be the best one, says John Sweeney of Morristown. Notre Dame, Penn State, or USC wins another national championship. In John's opinion, it's old news. Only Rutgers has that Rocky Balboa appeal that makes the story great. Well, I think he's got a great point. It's been a quarter century since Rutgers has gone to a bowl, and not even that. They've been pretty universally abysmal in that time, and now they've reemerged. Again, three Big East wins in the first four years for Greg Schiano, and he's got three this year. On third down and one, Colby Smith able to pick a hole and get the first down. Yeah, I, I think those are all great stories. I just hope that we don't forget about what Tulane had to deal with and go through with Hurricane Katrina. We, we saw them up close, and we tend to think about stories on the field, but the off the field had such an impact of what happened on the field with that team. It seems like lately all we do is talk about what's wrong with the BCS, for example, that we might have three more teams undefeated, and we forget some of the great stories right. in college football this year, like Tulane, like Alabama, like Penn State. Steve Spurrier at South Carolina, what he's done there. George O'Leary at UCF, and Greg Schiano at Rutgers. Here's Brahman, first down, dumping it up. Look at him hang in the pocket and find Jones, who gets the first down to the eight-yard line. <laughs> Well, take a look at the, at the move Jones puts on. He's here. He's going to come inside. Now, this takes time for him to come open in the window between the linebackers and to clear the official, and that's why Brian Brom had to wait so long, and he did a great job of taking the pressure to allow that route to develop. See that official ducky? There have been some officials that have taken a... A lot of hits this year, and that, that ball came whistling by him. Well, you know what you do in the secondary? When you see a receiver crossing like that, you yell crossing route to your linebackers, and he's supposed to knock the guy off so he can't cross. There was no linebacker anywhere near Montreal Jones on that play. Now, first and goal at the eighth. They got Brom out of the gun. Little shovel pass to Tinch inside the five. Tackled by Green at the two-yard line. We're seeing a lot of plays here in the second half that we did not see in the first half. Good block by Montreux Jones on the outside. Tinch, like a screen in basketball, just rubbed off of him, and he was open for about five yards. Now, Tinch knows something about basketball, doesn't he? Played on a Louisville basketball team a couple of years ago as a reserve. And they loved him. He added a big body to their, especially to practice. Bobby Petrino says he's the most enjoyable person he's ever coached. Play fake. Brom in trouble. Gets rid of it. Touchdown. Bruno G. Comini. How about Brom? Well, he can go to dinner tonight and ask his dad and his brothers. You guys ever throw one like that? When's the last time you guys saw a true sophomore this poised? Oh. Watch Brum look downfield. He keeps his eyes on his receiver even though the pressure is in his face. Now that is terrific for us. Seriously, when do you guys remember a true sophomore with this much poise? Extra point is good, and it is 35 to 5. I'll let you guys ponder that during the break. I got one for you. <laughs> Couple of TD passes and a TD run for Brom tonight. ESPN 2's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Taco Bell. Think outside the bun. And Mr. Goodwrench, found at GM dealerships nationwide. Rough night for Rutgers fans. 
There's a lot of time left, but down 30, thanks to Brian Brom, who has two touchdowns this half. He's eight out of nine, 79 yards, and two TDs in about nine minutes in this quarter. And I asked before the break, guys, when's the last true sophomore that you saw as poised as this kid? That's good to see him smile out there, but I got three names for you. You know, Peyton Manning comes to mind, seeing okay. him as a sophomore. John Elway as a sophomore. And Jake the Snake Plummer at Arizona State. I thought they were all outstanding as sophomores. It's been a long time, though, since those guys played college ball. Here's Willie Foster. And he's going to be taken down shy of the 20 at the 17. He was also a kid at Virginia Tech named Michael Vick. But he was not a true sophomore. He played as a redshirt sophomore. I meant a true sophomore. Now look at that guy. Well, now you say. That guy. No, I said true sophomore. Well, Brom looks like he's having fun now. I mean, he's up by 30. He's smiling. He's relaxed. A little relief. Nobody's on his back. Now, his brother's giving him a pat on the back. You see, that's the way you do it. Okay. Now, when you go Elway, you should get a pat on the back. <laughs> or Manning. But there are not many guys in the NFL who can make that throw. Teal on the play fake, and a pass broken up. He was trying to hit Moses, who has a 31-game streak in which he's caught a pass. But uh, it was Nate Harris that broke it up, the linebacker. And this all started before the game. Rutgers said, okay, we're going to stomp on the Cardinal at midfield. Well, this makes no sense at all. Not only does it inflame the Cardinals in their own house, but it also started Rutgers off on a path that led to eight penalties in the first half, including a couple of personal fouls, and they couldn't overcome it. There are two teams that tried that last year, East Carolina and Cincinnati. Why those two teams would try it, nobody knows. But look at that, 59-70. There's one thing if you're Miami and you do that, but you're East Carolina and you do that. Ray Rice grabbed by Nate Harris, who's had a heck of a series so far, making back-to-back -back plays in a third down and long coming up for Rutgers. Rutgers with injury at the uh, injuries at the quarterback position, both Hart and Teal with shoulder injuries. Neither 100%. Chiano going with Teal, and he has not played that well. He's got an interception, and they have yet to convert a third down. Brian Leonard has been pretty much shut out with the exception of that one hurdle that set up a field goal in the first quarter. Here Leonard makes the catch, nowhere to run. There is a penalty flag down as Leonard is taken down at the 18-yard line by William Gay. Hyman also in on the play, but again, a tackle down. I, I don't think Teal's ineffectiveness is because of his injury. I think that this on offense... The, on the offense, number 53. Penalties declined, fourth down. This offense has been so preoccupied with Doomerville that it's been totally out of sync. They've had to devote so many guys to this one man. There's one. There's another one. And all night we've seen two and sometimes three men come over to keep Doomerville out of the backfield. And that, that amount of tension disrupts your offense. Doomerville unofficially is responsible for three Rutgers false starts. Trevor talked about the penalties. Many of those early were false starts just because Doomerville was breathing on them. Robert Haskins on the punt return. Oh, and he gets hammered right at the 49-yard line. Did well to hang out of the ball. Again, it was Glenn Lee who's come up with a couple of hits on special teams tonight. Well, if Louisville can hang on and win this game, it would go to 3-2 and two in conference play. Rutgers would drop to 3-3, three and three, and then they're 6-4 and four overall. This is a team two weeks ago, Rutgers, that was pretty excited about being bowl eligible. They ripped down the goalpost. They stormed the field after beating Navy. But they're in trouble here after losing to South Florida last week. They'll wrap it up on the 26th of November against Cincinnati at home. And they won seven games the last time they were bowl eligible, 92, and did not get invited to a bowl game. With a penalty down, Brom completes the pass, but it's out of bounds. He still completed it to Tinge, but he was out of play when he caught it. If Rutgers can get that seventh win, not going to happen tonight, highly unlikely, but if they get it against Cincinnati... Offsides, on the defense, number 94. Five-yard penalty, remains first down. They're very likely to wind up in a bowl, likely the inside bowl. Longest bowl drought in all of college football for a BCS school, Rutgers. Obviously, the Big East champ goes to a BCS bowl. 
And then the Gator Bowl will be next to select. And if Notre Dame is not involved in the BCS, then Notre Dame could take a Big East Bowl, but it's looking like the Irish, uh, barring a collapse, will get into the BCS. As Brom looks to throw again on first and five, another flag down the pass incomplete. But the Gator gets the second choice, followed by the Insight and the Meineke Car Care, and it does not necessarily have to be based on whether you finish in second place or fifth place as long as you're eligible. Well, the inside bowl was very impressed with Rutgers when they defeated Navy to win their sixth game. The whole atmosphere, the, the fans, and the fact that Rutgers being the birthplace of college football, the first college football game played there, all appeals to the inside bowl. And the thing of it is, the inside company is a software company. Holding on the defense, number 90, 10-yard penalty from the previous high scrimmage. First down. The Inside Company is, is based in Arizona, but it does a lot of business in the New York area, and they've had their eye on Rutgers for a long time, and they'd love it if it's possible to get Rutgers to their bowl. Well, it makes it interesting if South Florida should somehow run the table and win the Big East and go to the BCSs. You've got two schools in Louisville and West Virginia, specifically, or in particular West Virginia, that travel very well. So if you're the Gator Bowl, you can take a West Virginia school that travels very well, or a Louisville school that traveled 30,000 to the Liberty Bowl last year, and both have pretty high-octane offenses, which could remain, could leave Rutgers. If Connecticut is eligible, that might be a tough call there for the Meineke Car Care between those two schools, if both those schools have six wins. Brom to the air on first down. And he's going deep for you, Ludia. And it's just over his arms incomplete. Corey Barnes on the coverage. Well, at the beginning of the year, Louisville thought they would be involved in the BCS. They're not. But had they been, they'd be looking at this. These are your components. The Harris poll, a new poll. The coaches poll, one-third. And computer rankings. And right now, the computers love Texas. The polls love USC. And that two-thirds to one-thirds weight advantage gives USC the top spot in the BCS. There's been a lot of talk about whether the Big East is deserving of a BCS bid, and they're guaranteed that automatic BCS bid through 2007. As that pass is complete inside the 10, and Louisville's going to have another touchdown. Joshua Tinch. Three touchdown passes now for Brian Brown. Well, you don't tug on Superman's cape, and you don't jump on Louisville's logo before the game. They are keeping the pedal to the floor. 36-yard touchdown pass. Three tonight for Brom. First for Tinch of the game. 17 TDs on the year for Brom. That one just squeaks through the right upright. And this is a blowout. 42 to 5, Louisville. Well, coming up, college football primetime presented by Polaroid Saturday, 745 Eastern, Auburn and Georgia. DJ Shockley back for Georgia after missing the Florida game with a knee injury. Obviously a huge game for both teams. Should be a good one tomorrow night. Take a look at the BCS standings presented by Allstate. The three undefeated, followed by Miami, which had that shocking win uh, just in the fashion that it beat Virginia Tech last week, and the Hokies fall to six, Penn State at five. I think that is just about right. The one flip I would make is I'd have Penn State ahead of Miami. I, I think we all got infatuated with Miami because of that last game with Virginia Tech, but Penn State has been impressive all season long in a tough conference. I'd flip those two. See, right, I'd flip Miami ahead of Alabama because really? they both play superlative defense, but Miami's offense is starting to click, whereas Alabama's offense has been struggling. Do you know how hard it is to go undefeated? It's very difficult, but I'll tell you this. USC in Texas, it looks like right now, if the season ended today, they'd be the national championship game, but USC does not want to see Miami's defense. It matches up very well in terms of speed with that Trojan offense. It's been a long time since Miami lost a game. Florida State, that opening Monday, that's... The only loss for the Hurricanes of the year, they have the number one defense in college football. What they did to Marcus Vick last week, a lot of people thought 
Virginia Tech would win that game, but not only the Miami win, but won easily as Vic was confused and turned it over a lot in that game as Foster takes it out to the 25, and that's where Rutgers will start this time. All I know is that it is very hard to go undefeated, and if you're in a major conference, you have to give some credit to that. Alabama is undefeated at this point. Miami has a loss. They lost early, and we were talking about Miami a few weeks ago about what would their offense be like? How good is your quarterback? And now, I don't know, you got to give credit to a team that's undefeated. Especially, the, you've got to give credit to Alabama because they've really been playing one-legged because of the loss of receiver Tyrone Prothor. They haven't had a deep passing game. Now, that might change tomorrow. <laughs> that could change tomorrow, but they're undefeated as of right now. And the one offensive touchdown for Alabama in the last three games is Rice has little running room, only a one-yard gain of the play. Yeah, one offensive touchdown in the last three SEC games for the Tide, but their defense has scored two in those last three SEC games, and that's why they've been able to remain undefeated. If Alabama can knock off LSU and Auburn, there's going to be one heck of a discussion about undefeated teams at the end. Whether they are one-dimensional or not, if you wind up undefeated coming out of the SEC, that's a pretty good resume. And I think that's a healthy discussion just because of what happened last year with Auburn. And don't forget about the uh, SEC championship game, too. A little toss sweep to Rice. And Louisville has really I'm shut down the running lanes. Only a couple of yards there. Not Rutgers night, but still has been a very good season as the uh, Scarlet Knights are bowl eligible. And Greg Schiano, when he took over, said that the program was just a disaster, not only on the field, but off. One out of every three players uh, could not get through school, flunking out, but nearly everybody is graduating that plays for Schiano. Well, he's definitely turned things around there. And with more on the academic success with Greg Schiano as head coach at Rutgers, here's Stacy. Dave, he really has turned things around academically. In fact, this year, to quantify how good of a turnaround it really is, the academic progress rating comes out every year, gauges a player's progress towards graduating. Rutgers was ranked fourth. The only schools ahead of Rutgers, Duke, Stanford, and Navy, in no particular order, he's really done wonders for this program, guys, and he's done it through great discipline and a belief in his players, and they've returned that belief, Dave. Well, and the NCAA now is going to reward schools financially that do well academically. What do you guys think about that decision? Well, they're talking about giving schools up to $100,000 for academic progress. And, and then they're talking about giving money to schools at the bottom end who aren't showing the progress but say that they don't have the money for tutors and for other helps. Uh, and, and that's an interesting thing. I, I like the idea of giving extra money to the schools at the bottom. I don't like the idea of using money as an incentive for the schools at the top. Well, there you see uh, Rice is down. That's why we have the delay. Now, Rice has been getting pounded a lot here in the second half. And he's a true freshman, so this stage of the year, you can understand why he'd be a little fatigued. And there he goes down at the 20-yard line. He might have cramped up just the way it looked. Because he was just standing there, and the next thing you know, he, he hits the turf. Here's a guy that's averaged about six yards a carry this season and, and three and a half tonight. He averaged over 130 yards the last four weeks. At 158 last week. Originally gave a verbal commitment to Syracuse, but then when Paul Pasqualoni was let go as head coach there, he decided to stay... Closer to home from uh, New Rochelle, New York, uh, outside New York City, and he'll play uh, at Rutgers. The Rutgers playing 15 true freshmen, and these true freshmen are coming in, benefiting from the success from the seniors that are just now experiencing that success, and that's part of building the program. Rutgers has yet to convert a third down tonight. Teal looking for Leonard on the screen. And he's going to get taken down shy of the marker again. William Gay on the stop about four yards before the first down sticks. And Rutgers will punt it away. Let's, let's go back to this academic issue. All right. This money for academics. Isn't that what schools are supposed to be doing anyway? Right. I mean, if they're supposed to be graduating and educating the student athlete, why are we paying them extra money to do that? Right. As Trevor said, why using money as an incentive? For good academics. Yeah. 
that money should go to the schools that are struggling if they need infrastructure in terms of tutors, uh, tutors and computers and things like that. Radigan to punt for the 70th time tonight. Not really, but close. Haskins and Jones back to receive. And Jones with running room. There's nobody down there for Rutgers. Jones inside the 40 and finally pushed out of play. Everything going right for Louisville in this third quarter, dominating Rutgers in all facets. You get the sense that Bobby Petrino had a little chat with this team at halftime. They got nothing really going offensively in the first half. They've picked it up in the second half. Special teams have improved. And right now, you see Morgan get going at Montreal Jones getting to the outside. A much better play. 31-yard punt return there. Yano, going to talk to his defense. He, as Rod mentioned in the first half, is one of seven head coaches to have a dual role as defensive coordinator. Trying to fire up his gang, see if they can stop Louisville. As Colby Smith leaps over a defender and gets to about the 32 for a couple. I, I think Shiano has to be concerned about his guys looking at the scoreboard. I mean, you have to play every play without looking at the scoreboard. He's got to get these guys to that point. They're not good enough to lay down a play or two. I mean, SC might be able to. Texas might be able to. But Rutgers can't take off the play. And that's one of the things he's trying to build in terms of the attitude. For the last quarter century, that has been the way Rutgers has been institutionally, and he's trying to change that attitude. Second and eight from the 32, and Bronx passes incomplete. Let's bring in Stacy for more on the Rutgers motto. Dave, there's no lack of fight in Rutgers, even in a game like this. One of the themes that Coach is always talking about to his players, and they all told me, we're chopping wood. We're going through a forest. The last five years has been a huge forest for this team. We're trying to tear down trees and make it out into the best place we possibly can, and that's a bowl game, guys. They're definitely on the road, although struggling today. As we mentioned earlier, the longest drive of any BCS school. 1978, the only bowl game for Rutgers is Brahma's going deep. Oh, my! How did he complete that? And Tinge is down at the one-yard line. How did Brian Brom complete that pass to Tinch? Quarterback Manny Collins, number 26, blitzes. Brom reads the blitz. And oh, he just gets nailed. He's unblocked. An accurate pass, even so. I got to think his brother, Jeff, has got to be happy with that. As you see, Tinch just run right by the defender. First and goal. And did the fullback get in? Yes. Touchdown, Rutgers. It was Kurt Quarterman who already has it. A la refrigerator Perry on the goal line and scores. And that kept Braun from getting his fourth touchdown pass of his quarter as Tinch got tackled to the one, but he set it up for his buddy, the right guard, Quarterman. Well, you're looking at a quarterback who's going to be pretty special. We talked about sophomores, Manning, Elway, Plummer. Pretty good, pretty good list to be in there with. Again, Brahm is a true sophomore. Played a little bit last year. Has been the man all season long. And again, there are not many guys who can complete that pass at any level. And you look at how this shapes up for next year. When you've got Vince Young said he's going to come back. You've got Brady Quinn. And you've got Brian Brahm who will be duking it out. Now look at the pressure. Number 26, Manny Collins, comes in unblocked. Drills it. Now, Brom can see Collins the whole way, but he kept his eyes downfield. And Chiano said, you know, my eyes are down. Now he gets him back up, and that's good. The reason he does that, he does not want his team to see him appear dejected. Well, he's got to be concerned about the fact that his team has him punched back. And Louisville in this third quarter has just taken shot after shot after them. 28 to nothing this quarter. And his team hasn't responded. And they have protected their house. Looking to go 5-0 in a year and make it 11 straight wins here at home 
Louisville will play Syracuse at home in a couple of weeks and wrap up the season at Connecticut because of a loss to West Virginia. Highly unlikely that uh, they'll win the Big East, but still a major bowl, perhaps the Gator Bowl in the future for Louisville. But the expectations were so high. Calling of the year, a lot of people said undefeated season. And then they got clobbered by South Florida uh, early in September. Flannery to put it away. Underwood inside the 10-yard line. Out to about the 23. Boise State with the longest home winning streak right now in college football at 30 in a row. Bobby Petrino's first year. Uh, right about this time in 2003, they got beat pretty soundly at home by Memphis. And this stadium holds 44,000 there. Got plans to expand it to 63,000. Clarence Pittman is into the game. We showed you earlier that Ray Rice, the starting tailback, fell to the turf and uh, appeared to be banged up. There's a great catch in the open field, and a flag comes in. Clark Harris, first team all Big East tight end a year ago, a guy that's wowed NFL scouts, showed terrific hands there, snagging that one out of the air, but again, a penalty flag down. Holding. On the defense, number 97. Penalties declined. First down. And that's the 100th career catch for Clark Harris. We are in Louisville, Kentucky, home of the 23rd-ranked Cardinals. The only team in the top 25. Not over 500 in their league, but that will change after tonight. Rutgers 0 for 10 on third down. And Brom has been outstanding. Three touchdown passes this quarter. Also a rushing touchdown. And only six incompletions for the true sophomore from Louisville, who stayed home to play his college ball and spurned schools like Tennessee and Notre Dame. And Teal going deep, looking for Sean Tucker. And the pass is nearly picked off by Rod Council. Incomplete. Rod Council was in great position on that play. Almost came up with it. He's a guy that was highly touted coming out of high school. Didn't play much his freshman year. Didn't play at all. Was down on the scout team getting ready for this season. Steps in this year as a redshirt freshman. Has really good feet. They've had some pretty good corners here. Sam Madison, who you watched uh, the Thursday night to broadcast against Pitt last week, uh, was here, was interviewed by Aaron Andrews, had his uh, number retired. There you see number 13 retired. Terrific NFL corner. But Mike Cassidy, the defensive coordinator, is in his second year at Louisville. Seen a lot of college at DBs. is really high in council. And Clarence Pittman taking off into the secondary and into Louisville territory. To about the 44-yard line. So Louisville outscores Rutgers 28-0. The defense not so bad either for the Cardinals. Five straight quarters without allowing a touchdown. They lead 49-5. A 28-point third quarter for Louisville pushes it to a 44-point lead. And the Cardinals are a perfect six out of six in the red zone. All touchdowns. And maybe there's a Jake Plummer fan coming to see if Brian Brom is as good as uh, Jake the Snake was. Well, if you blink, you miss it. That third quarter, 28 points in a hurry. And Brom had three touchdown passes that quarter. Teal is looking for his first touchdown pass of the night. And instead, it's picked off by the aforementioned Rod Council, who's been blanketing Rutgers receivers all night. Five straight quarters without allowing a touchdown, and on Council gets his first interception. Well, of the you year. see the great back pedal, and he sees everything. Now he works his way back outside. Highest point now for the ball. That's a blanket. That's a great job. And for a freshman, that is terrific progress because the problem Louisville has had on defense this year has been that the corners have not made plays on the ball in the air. In other words, they've been in coverage position, but the receivers beat them to the ball. That time, Council beat the receiver. Louisville starts this drive at the three-yard line. Colby Smith 
going to be stacked up at the line of scrimmage. Well, one thing that we need to add about Brian Brom is he's playing at home. Not only did he spurn Tennessee and Notre Dame, but he stayed to play at home, which Stacey Dale Schumann, Rod Gilmore, and Trevor Maddich, I would imagine for an athlete that's 18, 19 years old, it's got to be pretty tough to stay at home in front of your family and then have your family also be on the staff trying to play for him. Yeah, it, where you grew up, high school, middle school, all the expectations, great quarterback at Trinity High School. And all of a sudden now, all those people that followed him all that time still have their eyeballs on him and in his ear. Brom trying to dump it off, finds Smith, but it's incomplete, and there's a penalty flag down. Well, Stacy, I know you went away to play college basketball at Oklahoma, but you can certainly uh, relate being a terrific uh, college athlete, being under uh, a microscope at OU. Uh, what do you think it's been like for Brom? Well, thanks first for the compliments, Dave. Really kind of you. Uh, I was uh, actually from Canada and had a chance to go to Syracuse two hours from my home, and I opted to go the long route down to Oklahoma just because I wanted to explore something else, something different, and really help build a program but I can't imagine the scrutiny that you feel as the main guy the main person in your hometown like Brian Brom has everywhere he goes guys he's looked upon he is basically criticized for anything he does wrong and he does so much right but I really think it's all about personality Brian Brom a very mature individual very laid back he sat with us guys in meetings yesterday and just his calmness and collectedness was really impressive, Dave. All right, we'll see what he does here on a third down and 10, throwing out of his own end zone. Does pretty well. Finds Douglas for a first down at the 20. Well, Rod, you played close to home. I know Trevor and Stacy both went away to school, but you played very close to home uh, growing up uh, in uh, the Northern California area and then uh, going to school at Stanford. Uh, what was that like? Well, I think what happens to any player who stays close to home is that those around you in high school and the like expect whatever you do, whatever you did in high school, you will do in college and do better. I mean, the expectations are there and there's constant talk, feedback, criticism, praise. A running play out to about the 23. George Stripling on the carry there, gain of three. Every guy that you played with in high school still sees you in college. And they talk to everyone, all your friends, even your competitors, your family members. Everybody hears about it constantly. Michael Bush uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, as well played against Brian Brom at high school. Obviously uh, stayed here, hurt tonight with a foot injury. First game he's ever missed, including high school. Well, you're a true sophomore. Half the people you went in high school to high school with are still in high school just down the road from here. Here's Brahman second and seven. Double clutching. And then finding Douglas again. Only a couple of yards there. Montreal Jones rather on the tackle. So it'll bring up third down. Third down. Let's take a look at our game track. Brian Braun with a rushing touchdown. Brian Leonard with some acrobatics. Rutgers Bowl eligible for the first time since 1992, but then Brom took over in that third quarter. Boy, three touchdown passes in that quarter. And what's impressive is that he throws these passes when he sees blitzes coming at him and yet keeps his eyes downfield like an old, mature veteran. Coming into this game, second in the country in completion percentage and pass efficiency behind only Matt Leiner. <laughs> And we have a whistle. Snap. Penalty Play flag down. Number 12 on the offense. Five-yard penalty remains third down. One of the hard things about being in the city where you grew up and all the expectations is that most people don't fully understand what the expectation should be. Last year, as a freshman, when Brom played in the second quarter of most games, he had a special package. He only needed to know a few plays. Now he's got the entire offense. He needs to know every single thing. And even with that added burden, the first year of having that burden, he's the second-rated passer in the nation. And people don't understand what an accomplishment that is. Here's third and ten. Brom looking deep, going for Tinch again. And that might be offensive pass interference on Tinch. He was covered by Ron Gerald downfield. Well, no matter how well Brian Brom does at Louisville, there's a good chance that he won't be the best quarterback ever to come out of Louisville. 
Johnny Unitas played here for the Cardinals. Not a lot of people remember that, that he played uh, at Louisville. It's Johnny U. You got a statue, that usually means you're pretty good. Went on to be a terrific NFL quarterback as well. Played uh, here from 51 to 54. And you know where his first NFL team was, was the Pittsburgh Steelers, and they didn't think he was good enough. They mm. cut him, and then he went to Baltimore. I don't think Brom will get cut when he goes to the NFL. Just but guessing. That's one of the reasons he came here, was that he knew they ran an NFL-style offense, and, he, and even in high school he had his eye on the next level. First down from the 35. Little misdirection pitch, Strickland. Brought down at the 50 yard line. Well, you mentioned the NFL style offense. Bobby Petrino has NFL experience coaching in Jacksonville, and then at Auburn, and one of the smartest things he did, he targeted Brian Brom when he got this job as head coach, and he knew about Brom because Bobby was an assistant coach at Louisville in 1998 before going to the NFL. So he hires Jeff Brom to be the quarterback's coach, hires Greg as the director of football operations, and then is able to keep Brian Brom from leaving to go to a bigger school, bigger name school anyway, and stay here. But will Petrino stay here? Let's talk about that question after this play. First down to the 50. Brom with a quick drop. And a perfect throw to Yerudia. How about that pass? Okay, I know we want to talk about Petrino, but I, I got one question here. Why are you throwing the ball now? Why... With a 49 to 5 lead, because they stopped on the Cardinal they before the game. On the yeah, Cardinal. I know you made your point. You, you made your point. You know, you stumped on the Cardinal. We got 28 on you in the third quarter. Now you're in the fourth quarter, and you're still throwing with your first string quarterback. When is enough enough? It's never enough when you stop on the Cardinal. Fear the Cardinal. Look at that. That's got a beak and it's got teeth. It can peck you and it can chew you. Do not stomp on it. Stripling on the toss. And bounce out a play inside the 15. Dariante Taylor with a good block there. But you have to think about the health of your quarterback because the more you put him back there with the score like this, the more you encourage a defense to say, what the heck, go get the big hit on him. There's a penalty flag down on the play. You know, Rod, you mentioned, will Bobby Petrino be here? Most people remember what happened a couple years ago, flirting with Auburn, not telling Louisville about it until after the fact. And last year, he gets a raise and an extension at Louisville. And then five days later, after originally turning down an interview with LSU, he goes and interviews with LSU five days before their bowl game. That damaged the relationship with Tom Jerk, the athletic director, which Jerk said, hey, it's up to Petrino to come now and restore that relationship. It's on him. Yeah, in the second instance, he didn't do it behind their backs. He did tell them he was interested, and they went ahead. Now, the fact of the matter is he is such a young and outstanding offensive coach, people are going to pursue him every year. It's just a fact. Rob hits Tinch out of the flat, and he's out at the 21-yard line. Petrino, in his second stint at Louisville, was the offensive coordinator in 1998. Then uh, worked with uh, Tom Coughlin. You can see a lot of Coughlin and Petrino in their offense and also in their demeanor. And then uh, the Auburn offensive coordinator. And then back here as the head coach, 26-7 and seven record. And I mean, you're right, Robin. There are going to be a lot of schools. There may be another SEC school that comes after Petrino. He's only 44 years old. He's got head coaching experience. He had an outstanding offense his first year here. You know, almost 50 points a game last year. And they're in top st uh, statistically this year. I mean, he's going to get interest. And you wonder when his name will join Kirk Ferentz and some of the other college coaches that are getting looks from NFL teams. Well, he very well could because he runs an NFL-style offense. North Carolina counted 90 different combinations of formation and personnel, and that's very much like an NFL offense. And, but I think it's a good thing to have people want your head coach because that means that he's doing something right. The Sony Erickson WTA Championships coming up next here on ESPN2. Louisville started this drive at the four-yard line. Down now to the 21 of Rutgers. And Brom going to work again. Colby Smith is wide open. 
cut down at the seven yard line. Courtney Green to stop. It has been all Louisville tonight. Coming in averaging 46 points per game. The Cardinals are 49. Coming in averaging 26 yards given up. They've allowed only five to Rutgers. Louisville was the only ranked team not above 500 in their conference and this was the last league that people thought would keep a team like Louisville from getting above 500. They thought the losses might come out of conference for Louisville this year. Stripling strips it away from the tackle and gets down to about the one. It'll be second down and goal. Louisville's already six out of six in the red zone with six touchdowns and they're at the one. Well, if I'm Greg Schiano, I, I'm really disappointed that I'm not getting any kind of a response out of my defense. Well, it takes us back two weeks ago after the celebration from getting the ball eligible. Did Rutgers overdo it in terms of celebrating with still three games left in the season? I don't know that they overdid it so much as that they know how to handle adversity. That's all they've had. Handling success is new. Stripling, but a flag down, dead ball foul. Well, those guys at the bottom of that pile for nothing. <laughs> Fire to snap. False start on the offense. Number 59. Five yard penalty. Remains second down. Well, back to your point, Dave, about overdoing it. When you get your sixth win and you give the head coach a Gatorade bath, and then your fans rush the field and tear down the goalpost when you're only bowl eligible, I think that's overdoing. And that's that's not understanding what you do when you win or when you get there. And they're not there yet. One more win, and then they're in a bowl game. So that big celebration was a little bit premature. Second and goal at the six. Stripling in the carry. And Stripling is in. Touchdown, Louisville. Sixth game, scoring 50 points or more under Bobby Petrino, and three of those have come when the opponent has stopped on the Cardinal before the game. He's got a little bit of Steve Spurrier in him. He doesn't mind putting points up against you. Well, Steve, or Chris Spielman said, it's not up to Louisville to stop Louisville. Louisville's not playing Louisville. Extra point good, and it is 56 to 5. Now the last two teams that did it got blown out. Rutgers getting hammered as well tonight after stomping on the Cardinal before the game. They ticked off a mad bird. To your house, log on to 100yardblitz.com to enter. And Joshua Tinch has played at Freedom Hall a couple of years ago, was a reserve on the basketball team. Louisville went to the Final Four last year. Takes a lot to uh, turn a basketball town football crazy. But they have here in Louisville. Even though a lot of the fans disappointed with the season so far, two losses for Louisville. But hey, fifth straight sellout crowd, over 41,000 tonight. Many of the fans uh, have left with the score 56 to 5. Louisville has eight touchdowns. Rutgers has seven first downs. And Louisville doing this without the leading scorer in the country. Michael Bush is out with a foot injury. Taekwon Underwood on the kick return. The kicker to beat, and then Underwood gets tackled by his own man. And that right there is a microcosm of this night for Rutgers. Arthur ran in to Underwood, who might have had a Another 20 yards in the return. Well, if, it's, if you're Rutgers, this is your kind of night. You got a big return going by Underwood. He comes to make a move, and look who makes a tackle. <laughs> a big hit. <laughs> your own guy. That's a good job of holding on to the ball by Underwood. Your own guy gets you. Well, the thing is, though, he wouldn't have been that far if not for the block Barkle threw. So we can't really say it's Barthel's fault that he didn't score a touchdown. Barthel sprung him for the extra 10 yards. A first down at the 36-yard line and teal to the air. 
and overthrows Sean Tucker. Incomplete. It'll be second down and ten. Teal replaced Ryan Hart. Very tough decision for Greg Schiano to make that kind of a switch. You're talking about a senior who'd been with the program through the lean times, and now they're on the verge of getting into a bowl game, and he's moved over to the redshirt freshman. He said it was really hard for him to make that decision, but he had to do it because of the, up, the upside for Teal. And Teal started the Syracuse game. Uh, they went into the carry over and won that game as Leonard takes it inside the 30-yard line. Then he got hurt next week against Connecticut, return of the fourth quarter against South Florida. Well, there's some great games in the SEC tomorrow. We've got Auburn, Georgia for you on primetime. And also LSU, Alabama playing tomorrow. And Florida, South Carolina, Steve Spurrier against his old school. Spurrier doing a great job at uh, the other USC this year. Who wins this game, guys? Well, I think Florida's got the edge. They have better players, but South Carolina will tax them. Florida's secondary has injuries, and Spurrier likes to run multiple vertical routes to stress that secondary deep. So you're taking Florida? I think Florida wins, but it'll be it'll be tight. Nice run by Pittman to get the first down to the 25-yard line. You take a look at some of the storylines. Florida, 14 straight wins. South Carolina, the first Spurrier game versus Florida. Uh, and I just think that South Carolina, if they can play with the same kind of passion that they did against Tennessee in a home game here, a lot of folks, I think South Carolina could win that ballgame. And if you have ESPN game plan, either via television or online, you can see that game at 12.30 Eastern. South Carolina could knock Florida out of the SEC East race. South Carolina... Uh, ends up winning that game, and Georgia wins. Uh, Florida would be out. Pass incomplete through the hands of Buchanan. I do agree with you, Trevor, though, that if Chris Lee is playing well, it's hard to beat Florida. Well, South Carolina won four straight. They lost to, to Auburn 48-7. to Everybody forgot all about them after that. And Spurrier's brought them back, but keep in mind, this is the first year. Rough of the passer. On the defense, number 88. Half the distance to the goal, automatic, first down. Silly penalty anytime, especially this stage of the game with a 51-point lead. But Spurrier's installing his fun and gun offense, which is now called the cock and fire for South Carolina, to a, a, an offensive personnel group that was recruited to run the option under Lou Holtz. And so it's amazing what Spurrier has accomplished this year. Don't forget tennis coming up next here on ESPN2. Teal has Rutgers at the 12. Pittman bounces off one man and gets to the 10, so a couple of yards there. Hard to believe it looking at the score, but we felt that Rutgers had outplayed Louisville in the first half. They out-hit them. They just gave them a couple of easy scoring opportunities with an ill-advised throw before halftime that set up a touchdown and a big kick return, set up another touchdown. The penalties have kept Rutgers from opportunities to score, creating third and long too many times. But do keep in mind that Louisville does this to pretty much everybody that shows up at Papa John's Cardinal Stadium. Yeah, they won 10 in a row here, trying to make it 11 straight. Second and eight for Rutgers from the 10. Bay for Moses, incomplete. We talked a lot tonight about some of the great stories in college football this year, like Steve Spurrier. How about the disappointments? There are eight teams in the preseason 25 who are still not bowl eligible, and the biggest surprise right at the top, Tennessee preseason number three, and they're three and five on the year. Yeah, quite, quite surprising. Tennessee, though, played, what, four teams that were ranked in the top ten at the time they played them, and two of those, they lost because they fumbled the ball just before they crossed the goal line for what would have been points that would have won the game. There's third and eight at the 10. Leonard. Pushed out of the four, and Rutgers will go for it here on fourth down. Other than those eight teams we saw, preseason top 25, not yet bowl eligible, what are some other disappointments uh, in college football this season, guys, in your opinion? Well, I think one of the teams we're looking at tonight, I think Louisville has been a disappointment because they had an opportunity to make a big splash in the Big East, and I think their fans would say they expected them to win the Big East or have only one loss. They've had two losses. 
the first loss was at South Florida. And I think we may find a few years from now that that win by South Florida over Louisville this year was the start of the awakening of the sleeping giant down in Tampa. I'm going to question you because you're the same guy that had Washington State doing nasty things to USC. That's not what I said. <laughs> Here they run the ball on fourth down and two to Leonard, and they didn't get it. And Louisville will take over. A. Brown made the play. Well, South Florida over Louisville was uh, one of the most shocking scores in college football. How about just a one-game shocker? Arizona ending UCLA's run at an undefeated season, hammering them 52-14 to last week. Well, that was surprising to a lot of people, but not to Kurt Herbstreit. He called that on game day before it happened. Louisville, 56, Rutgers, 5, and the Cardinals take over on offense again when we come back. ESPN 2's College Football Primetime is presented by the Nikon D50 Digital SLR. Incredible pictures made incredibly easy. And in part by Suzuki. Introducing the all-new Grand Vitara, the authentic SUV. Well, Brian Brom got trampled, sacked in the first two snaps, but then got back on the horse and threw three touchdown passes and a rushing score, and Louisville galloping to a win over Rutgers, leading by 51. And the backup quarterback is in the game, Hunter Cantwell, a freshman. Running play out to the seven-yard line. Gain of about four yards in the play for Stripling. The last six possessions for Louisville, two of which started inside their five, have resulted in touchdowns. Now, do you remember how both Bobby Petrino and Jeff Brom, the quarterback coach, got all over Brian Brom earlier in the game, even though it looked like he was doing pretty well? Because they knew if he improved his precision just a little bit, this would happen. Now they're happy. Another handoff to Stripling into the open field and up to the 22 yard line tennis follows us here on espn2 and let's check in with cliff drysdale for an update cliff dave maria sharapova is trying to defend her title here in los angeles after a dramatic three-set win last night against world number one lindsey davenport she's looking very strong she plays country woman Nadia Petrova at the WTA Tour year-ending championships from the Staples Center. Back to you, Dave. Thank you, Cliff. And we'll be done here in about five and a half minutes or so. 56 to five is the score. And a running play out near the 26-yard line. Eight of four. You know, tennis would be a perfect sport except for two things. One is the end line. You know you can't hit it past that. And the other is the net. Take away those two things, you've got a great game. At tackling, would that help too? For <laughs> that would be good. That coming from an offensive lineman that doesn't like to chase tennis balls around. Cantwell, a freshman. Hands off, and Spencer gets drilled. You know, last year, Brian Brom came in for Stefan LaForce as they were gearing Brom up for life without LaForce, but they've gone away from that philosophy this year with Cantwell as the backup. <laughs> Now, last year, they made it clear that they wanted to get Brian Brom ready for the move to the Big East. And Cantwell doesn't get time now because, as we talked about, Brom didn't get a lot of snaps. He had maybe 20 plays a game or so last year, and he needs repetition. So that's why they have him out there, and they're not going with a two-quarterback system. And Cantwell throws a pretty good pass to Haskins. Wrapped up at the 49-yard line by Ron Gerald. Nice throw. Gain of about 24. Well, the good thing about scoring so many points is it gives them the opportunity to give Hunter Cantwell, their freshman quarterback, some reps as well. Because yeah. right now, he's he's the guy if Braun gets hurt. And last year, they made sure Braun was ready if LaForce got hurt and it paid off. In the Miami game, they're trying to get that to happen now. I'm just not a big fan of throwing the ball late when you've got a big lead like this. And I, Whether it's your backup quarterback or your starting quarterback, it just seems to me you ought to run out the clock. It's been a long time since these two schools met, but they're going to meet every year from here on out now, both in the realigned Big East Conference. 
Spencer inside Rutgers territory to the 48. You know, though I could see why Bobby Petrino wants to do that because he's got a, a freshman quarterback out there. He's got to get some game speed experience. And if all he does is hand off, then maybe down the road he will wish that he threw the ball more well, in a situation like well, this. Well, the response to that is simple. If you want him to throw the ball, put him in there in a meaningful situation and let him throw it. If you want to finish up the game, you know, let him hand it off, let him hand it off. I mean, if you want to get real game speed, don't put him in with a 51-point lead and throw the ball. Spencer grabbed from behind by Neal and ran to the floor at the 45. Well, Bobby Petrina told us uh, this week that it was a special situation last year with Brom and that uh, he's not going to go that route this year at all, putting in a backup quarterback to get him reps. And obviously there were a lot of reasons behind that last year, putting Brom in the game. Well, I, I think one of the reasons is that when you convince that talented a guy to say no to Notre Dame in Tennessee and come to Louisville, he's got to play. He can't sit on the bench. You got to play him. There's third down and five. And about a yard shy of the marker is Spencer. Well, guys, we talked about the red zone success tonight for Louisville. Touchdowns at every opportunity inside the 20. They also have what they call a critical zone. And with more on that, here's Stacey Dale Schumann. Well, Dave, they complete 88% of the opportunities in the red zone, but the red zone to this coach who thinks outside the box offensively is the critical zone. He looks at the red zone, which is 20 yards and in, 30 yards and in. He does it because he wants an ultimate focus in his players, and they really have schemes, guys, set up already in mind. They're very focused offensively when they get to that mark. Well, this is a real surprise here. They go for it on fourth down. They get a 51-point lead. Again, I guess if you stomp on our logo, we're going to stomp on you during the game, and we won't stop until there are zeros on the clock. I'm just, I'm not a big fan of it. I mean, you got a fourth down, a minute and a half to go. You can kick the ball away and in the ball game. But they did jump around and dance on the old Cardinal. They didn't like that, and they're making them pay for it. But at this point, it gains you absolutely nothing. Spencer bouncing off tacklers to the 38. You see, a lot of defensive players would not take that. They, they'd find a way to get a shot, get a hit on somebody to say, you're not going to pull this stuff and get away with it. Yeah, but pull what? But pull what? I mean, if, if USF can't stop Louisville, so what? They've pulled their starters. They've got a freshman quarterback in there. If they want to stack the box, then throw the ball. I mean, why should the defense get mad at that? If you want to stop the pass, stop if, the pass. If, if, if I were the D coordinator and you guy wanted to throw the ball, we'd let him throw it and we'd blitz and we'd get some shots on him. Look at this. They've got eight in the box right now. Why not throw? You got two tight ends in. <laughs> but there's no fullback. They still overload the back. Yeah. But see, I see the point. You got to get your, your young quarterback ready, Rodden. I think we disagree here. Yeah, I like you gotta it. You got to get him ready, play him in the game when it's meaningful. It is meaningful. It's game time. Well, Greg Shiano's team is bowl eligible, but they've lost two in a row. And now the Cardinals are dancing on their own logo at midfield, saying, take that, Rutgers. Final score, 56 to 5, as Louisville makes it 11 straight home wins. We'll come back, wrap things up from Kentucky after this. Almost 400 yards total offense in the second half. Ryan Brom throws three touchdown passes in the third quarter. Louisville, which trailed 3 0, wins 56 5. Guys, your thoughts on what you saw out of Louisville, uh, Louisville tonight, and in particular, Brian Brown. Well, I thought the offense was impressive without Michael Bush out there. Still very explosive. And I think Brian Brown is, is just an incredibly talented young quarterback. He's going to be fantastic <laughs> if he stays in college much longer. Yeah, I think the thing that impressed me the most was how he kept his eyes downfield as he saw blitzers coming right at him, right up the middle, and still hit the receiver rather than focusing on avoiding the blitzer. The last three teams to stop on the Cardinal logo have been stopped on 
by Louisville's offense. 59 points, 70 points, and then 56 tonight. This was the scene before the game. At the end of the game, it was Louisville dancing on its own logo. That's it from Louisville. Tennis is up next. Here's Cliff Drysdale.